That's the be quiet symbol. Thank you. Uh, all right, call to order the uh, July 30th, 2019 meeting of the North Andover Planning Board. We're going to jump around a little bit in our agenda. Uh, we'll start with 62 Sail Way, Maria and Anthony DeMarco. Application for a watershed special permit under Part 5, Watershed Protection District, and Section 195-10.7 of the North Andover Zoning Bylaw. The project involves the construction of an in-ground swimming pool and paper patio with non -discharge buffer within the non-discharge buffer zone. The project is located within the R1 Zoning District. Hi. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, my name is Greg Hawkmuth from Williams and Sparagis, here representing the applicants, uh, Anthony and Maria DeMarco, for the water spe uh, shed special permit application for their property at 62 Sail Way. Um, 62 Sail Way, does everybody know where that is? Nope. It, so it's pretty close to the golf course. It's a cul-de-sac that goes down the hill. Um, there's probably about a dozen or so homes. It was constructed in the 90s, part of the Great Pond Estates. This is the second to last house on the left. Uh, just before you get to the cul-de-sac. Um, we're here before you this evening uh, with the hopes of securing a watershed special permit for the construction of an in-ground swimming pool and paver patio um, in the non-discharge buffer zone uh, related to a isolated vegetated wetland that's located in the front of their property. The pool and patio are outside of the 400-foot non-discharge buffer zone from the lake itself, um, but this is from the wetland that is within the watershed to Lake Pachikaway. <coughs> There's not too many options on this property for siting the proposed pool and patio. Um, the front, front, front yard, as you can see, uh, there's, this is the wetland here. Um, this is the limit of the non-disturbed zone, and the 400 foot from the non-discharge is somewhere out in here. So the closest point in the pool to the wetland out front is about 196 feet, plus or minus. Um, Pushing it further back on the lot would require the removal of uh, a lot more trees. We tried to shoehorn it in an area that um, straddles the wooded buffer zone uh, behind their house and the rooftop infiltration chamber system that's currently installed to handle the roof runoff, which really forced the pool in this location. Um, the, the clients are happy with it in that spot, so it was, wasn't too hard to convince them that that's where it had to go. Um, as mitigation for the slight increase in impervious surface, we are proposing an infiltration trench around the perimeter of the pool that should help infiltrate uh, stormwater during, you know, most storm events. The pool itself, as you can see, it's not very large. It's a modest-sized pool. Um, it's a kidney-shaped pool. It has a small spar in front. Uh, the patio we're proposing would be a bluestone patio. Uh, to match the existing patio that's currently on the rear of the rear of the house. Uh, we were before the zoning board last month and we secured a variance uh, for the construction of the pool. Uh, any new structure within the non-discharge zone uh, requires a variance from the zoning board as well as a watershed special permit from you folks. Uh, the zoning board had some questions about if we ever had to dewater this pool, what our plans would be. And, and we simply said if the swimming pool ever had to be dewatered completely, that we'd pump it onto a truck and remove it from site. But anybody that has a pool knows after a major storm event, uh, sometimes you have to let some water out. And certainly before you winterize the pool, you have to let some water out. So we told them that we'd let the pool sit um, for at least a week to allow the chemicals to uh, dissipate prior to winterizing the pool. Um, and then it would be safely pumped into either the rooftop infiltration system that's currently right next to it, or a separate dry well. Um, so the clients are fully prepared to put a dry well in um, if this board doesn't want them to introduce additional water into the rooftop infiltration system. Um, but it does appear to be oversized. It seems to be working fine. The soils in the area are moderately well-drained. We didn't see any signs of failure when we were in the rear of this yard. So we think that would be a good approach for dewatering. Uh, we did submit a, a, an O&M for the infiltration trench, uh, but we didn't submit any type of O&M for the pool itself. But we did note that it would be a non-backwash filtration system. It would be one of the cartridge filters. Um, all pool chemicals would be stored in the garage until the clients um, either propose a shed or another suitable storage area for the pool chemicals. 
Um, I guess in summary, it's, uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this, there's not a lot of options for siting the pool. We did try to balance tree removal um, and respect the, the zones and really try to get this thing as far away as we, we could, and, and we think we've done that. Uh, I just wanna see if I, if I missed anything. Uh, we're, we're outside the buffer zone, uh, so we don't require a permit from conservation. But conservation did have some comments, um, which we're fully prepared to um, adhere to. One of them was there's a catch basin that's currently uh, in the driveway in this area here. Um, and Amy had mentioned that we should put a silt sack in that during construction, just in case any sediment tries to migrate down the driveway. Uh, we can do that, and I believe she wanted some erosion controls and stockpile um, areas shown on the plan as well, which we could also do. Uh, the plan was also submitted to um, the town engineer for his review and comment, and he submitted a letter um, saying that it appears the applicant has made reasonable effort to site the proposed pool as far away from the resource areas, including an isolated vegetated wetland and the watershed protection district non-discharge boundary as possible. In addition, the proposed design does include a proposed infiltration tent trench to be constructed around the pool and patio area to allow any stormwater to drain and infiltrate back into the ground. Uh, the proposed design appears to meet the watershed special permit requirements and the DPW has no further comment. we have from Amy Maxner, conservation agent, says that the, the front paver walkway is within the 100-foot buffer zone and would require a permit from conservation. Well, I thought you were referring to the pool patio. Yeah, okay. That's an existing yeah. condition, so I'm okay. not sure if Amy was aware of that. that okay, so that's what I'm trying to Nothing on the front is actually being constructed. Right, so nothing that we're permitting right. needs to go to conservation. Right. Okay, that's what I wanted yeah, to say. I think there was some confusion. Okay, that, that I shared that confusion, so that's why okay. I wanted to make sure. Okay. Um, all right. Anything uh, else? So I would just recommend the O&M plan get updated to include the dewatering either into the dry well or the roof infiltration system um, and the procedures for the two week wait in order for the chemicals to dissipate. So that should be included. Do, do people have preferences or thoughts on the um, rooftop versus dry uh, well? Seems to me rooftop might be better, but I don't know, Peter, do you have any thoughts on that? Whatever is the best practice. Yeah, so. Well, the, the roof um, chambers already exist right. as long as they're sized appropriately, and you can conclude that they are. Yes. That seems to be okay. Okay. So, um, is this something we could have a draft decision for our next meeting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we so only say that because the when they're trying to dewater this, it wouldn't be during a major storm event right. when that's actually trying to handle the roof runoff, anyways. Okay. Um, do any members of the public have any questions or comments? Uh, I, I have oh, you have questions. Go ahead. Uh, what's the uh, slope topography of where the pool is? Is it relatively flat or what's? So it's it's tucked in a low spot that does drain this way ever so slightly. Um, we are picking up the grade, but not such that we're trapping water here. The water will still be able to go where it's trying to go now. Um, the pitch on the patio will be slight to direct stormwater towards the trench that runs the perimeter of the proposed patio. See, I'm just trying to get a sense of how much <coughs> land disruption and whether you have to do any cutting or filling. We're gonna have to cut a few trees um, and we are proposing to fill a little bit. We've got a small retaining wall here. Um, so we're gonna try to balance. There's actually a small cut here and a small fill here. I think we'll have enough material on site that we won't have to import anything we'll probably have to remove a little bit of material for the uh, pool hole. Are you concerned about the root system that any of the trees that are remaining with the excavation? Uh, no, we, we've, um, we've maintained enough of a buffer around it that we don't think will affect the uh, rooftop infiltration system at all. So the root system of the existing trees. I'm sorry? The root system of the existing oh, the, trees. Uh, so those, those trees that we, we will be removing are very close to the excavation. It's here, 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 and here. I think there's about four of them. Um, but the remaining trees should be fine. 
the, the clients uh, want to keep as many trees as possible. So this is a case that's a relatively small project, but have we had anybody review this from a technical perspective? Just John Pugliese did the stormwater review. Oh, okay. The so town engineer, yep. So um, I don't think we have any further questions. So uh, we'll, we'll have a draft decision uh, written up and try to decide to take a vote on the next at the next meeting. Okay. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, 701 Salem Street, 701 Salem Street Realty Trust is a continued public hearing. Application for a special permit, site plan review, parking under part one, off street parking and loading, part three, site plan review, and 195 10.7 of the North Andover zoning bylaw to allow for the construction of an 8,700 square foot addition to an existing building to be used for mixed use retail restaurant together with associated parking spaces, stormwater management facilities, landscaping signage, and other site improvements. The project is located within the general business zoning district. Jean, want to give us a so in your, where we are? In your packets tonight is a presentation that was submitted, I believe, yesterday, um, as well as a couple of comments that were submitted since the weekend. So I emailed a couple over the weekend. The rest I did not email. You have my copies. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll hear from the applicant and anyone on his team about um, any changes, anything you've done since our last meeting. If you'd like to address any of the comments that have been submitted, you can do that now, uh, or you can do it if um, after people speak, uh, after the applicant and anyone for the team um, talks and answers our, our questions, um, then we'll have anyone who wishes to speak on this come up and go from there. Good. Good evening and thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the Planning Board. My name is Jim Zanakis and along with my cousin Michael, we are the owner of the two commercial properties located at 695 and 701 Salem Street. For the last 14 years, my home has been at 687 Salem Street, which is one of only two properties that directly abut the commercially zoned area. My family has been in business in this location for 21 years and in that time we have seen significant growth in the demand for services that we provide. When we began planning the project that is before you, we looked at what the permitted uses are under general business zoning. Eventually, we settled on the idea of expanding the existing stores and offering additional services to our customers. During the planning stage, we looked at the existing laws of the town of North Andover and sought to design the property within the framework of those laws. Our building design does not require any zoning or conservation relief we are in compliance with all relevant setbacks and building height requirements. We are well under the minimum percentages for lot coverage, maximum percentages for lot coverage, and our landscaping and lighting plans are in accordance with existing town bylaws. We also looked at how we can fix some of the deficiencies of our existing design. Over the years, we have noticed that our parking lot is too small to accommodate large vehicles such as landscaper trucks with trailers. Part of the problem is that the existing parking lot is a dead end at both sides and does not go entirely around the building. There is an entrance and exit on Salem Street as well as Abbott Street, but cars cannot go all the way around. Also, there is no defined space currently for loading and receiving. This creates the potential for congestion along Salem Street and Abbott Street as well within the parking area itself. The design of the new lot is a significant improvement. We will now have two lane traffic around the entire building. In addition, there is a space in the back right section of the lot that is designated for loading and receiving. We have improved the curb cuts so that vehicles can enter and exit more freely. And at the suggestion of the town, we moved the Salem Street entrance to be far away from the Abbott Street corner. And this is designed in accordance with public safety concerns. At the first two planning board public hearings, our neighbors expressed concern regarding the existing traffic pattern. Although the new, building will the new building design will address these concern, we immediately implemented a new parking plan to help until we can make more significant changes. In June, we reached out to all of our vendors to see if they could send smaller delivery trucks whenever possible. In such cases, instead of, we will have a box truck deliver instead of an 18-wheeler or a cargo van instead of a truck. We requested fewer deliveries from our vendors each week wherever possible. 
We also informed our staff and many of our customers on where they should be parking and reminded them to, re to be as respectful as possible of the neighborhood. After the first two public hearings, we also heard that there needs to be a long-term solution to where landscaper vehicles can park. We looked at parking spaces three through eight, as well as one, two, 69, and 70 as being able to accommodate larger vehicles. After the July 9th meeting, we revised the plans to show spaces three through eight with deeper space, allowing a longer vehicle to pull straight in and park as opposed to turning into a conventional parking space. We are happy to designate those spaces as being preferred parking for larger vehicles and to post signage to that effect. We believe that this will significantly help alleviate the parking congestion along Abbott, Salem, and Keys. After the first two public hearings, we also heard that the new building height was of concern to the neighbors. Although the original plan was well below the maximum of 35 feet, we reduced the building height by six feet to match as close as possible to the existing J&M building. At the last two public hearings, we also heard that the planning board would prefer there to be a fence along the front property line along Salem Street. We believe that this is not an ideal solution for reasons previously discussed at the hearings. However, we included it in the most recent plan. We have also approached the two abutters across Salem Street and the one abutter across Abbott Street and have offered to install arborvitaes or any other barrier for screening purposes along their property lines and in lieu of a fence. We believe that this provides significantly better screening from light and sound. As of today, we have only heard back from the neighbor on Abbott Street who has accepted the offer of creating the landscape buffer. The Town of North Andover has previously stated through its Master Planning Committee that the, the desire to have greater commercial development in the outcountry section of North Andover. We believe that this project helps to achieve that stated goal. Since before the, the first public hearing, we have been communicating with the neighbors and abutters. Our goal has been to have an open and transparent conversation about the expansion. As evidenced by the changes to the plans before you, we have worked hard to address their concerns. Throughout the hearing process, we have done everything that the planning board has asked of us, both technically and with respect to the abutters. Since the proposed plans became public in June, we have heard from hundreds of our customers in the neighborhood who are supportive of our proposal and excited to see the new design. This year, my family will begin our 40th consecutive year of small business ownership in North Andover. We intend for this expansion to be a true asset to the community, and we look forward to providing top quality service to the people of the town for many more years to come. Thank you for your time. All right. Gentlemen, do you have anything that you wish to add? I, that was covered a lot. Yeah, I think that, uh, for the record, my name is Phil Henry with Civil Design Group. I guess just to supplement what Jim had said, aside from what he mentioned about parking and site circulation, uh, from a technical standpoint, there was a second peer review letter from Horsley Witten, which had, I think, two, two or three comments half of which they agreed to, they agree with us in, in, in accepting a condition on certain items. And then there were uh, two items that we had to uh, include, which was the illicit discharge statement as a standalone document, and also to show where certain temporary staging items were gonna be during construction. And we've shown that. We have not received a letter back from Horsley Wooden, but I, I would assume that uh, that would, um, that would, our responses would be sufficient. Like, it looks like oh, the, the letter. Um, oh, now I see yours, but it looks, it does look like it's sufficient. Uh, okay. okay, great. And then uh, conservation had uh, some comments regarding um, landscaping replacements. We we had re uh, removed and replaced, or or you know those those proposed trees, and then. Um, the fire department wanted us to show the truck circling around the entire property, which, which is shown on this plan here. And then the water department, uh, there was a, some, some clarification on services. Uh, we are reusing the existing service that currently serves the, uh, uh, the current building, so we can expand upon that existing infrastructure. So uh, other than that, uh, you know, we, we echo the, the comments that Jim had, had made by elongating you know, the, those parking spaces, adding signage, and adding um, that, that opaque fence that Mr. Simons has suggested uh, at the last hearing. So I think in summary, we, we actually, you know, we took the comments and the abutters' comments um, very specifically, and we tried to address each one itemized. Jeff, I, think it's, I think it's important to emphasize that point as I took away three or four things, maybe you can do them in order. Sure. Again, show 
where the parking is for the oversized vehicles. Sure. So, so these parking spaces here, we thought there was an opportunity to um, elongate those parking spaces above and beyond a typical 18 foot long space uh, because we had, we had room to do so just based on the geometry of relaying out the proposed parking. So these, these six spaces here are, are, are 26 feet long. Um, so eight, they're eight feet longer than, than a typical parking space. And I'd also note that they are also not restricted by head-in parking on the other side too. So you know, we're not counting the potential overhang um, availability to, to said vehicle. Um, and we've added signage that, that represents that as well. There are two parallel spaces along the building here spaces one and two that we've identified for um, a trailer parking or you know, a, a, a landscape truck or, or, or whatnot or even, or even a large single unit vehicle. The, there is a parking space back here that is striped accordingly, but as you can see, there is, there is, there's ample space right here that would not interfere with normal circulation around the building. And then there's also a space over here, space 69, that also um, allows for an, an oversized vehicle as well. So I think, I think in summary, I think, I think no one would, would, would dispute that this is an improvement over the existing conditions just by mere parking and site circulation. The fact that you can circulate around the building um, is, is definitely an improvement over the existing condition. And, and can you talk about the, so the reduced height? So the one it was the height of the new market is going to be, uh, and that's been reduced six feet, I believe yeah, Jim I, said. Almost six feet, right, Tom? About right. Six, yeah, almost okay. six feet. Okay. So it, is it just sort of is the way to look at it? It just comes down, or what? What? Um, we, we did. I'm Tom Calvin with Lagrasse and Associates. Um, what we did was we reduced the height of the perimeter wall by two feet, and then we adjusted the pitch of the high roof, going from an eight pitch to a six pitch. All of that dropped that ridge of the high roof by about five foot nine. Okay. And, and you added the fence to the plan, as well as potentially putting arbor, either and or putting some screening on the neighbor's property if they consent, which I think yeah, is. Yeah, I think I, as, as, as Mr. Zanakis has indicated, I, he, he went door to door and, and spoke to these folks across Abbott Street and then spoke to the two abutters right across from Salem Street offering some off-site vegetation. That's my understanding, and I'm sure you'll hear from them uh, tonight, so I certainly don't want to speak for them. Um, but um, in, in, in lieu of that, uh, we, we, uh, we are proposing a four-foot-high um, opaque fence. And I think it's also important to note that we were proactive, m m and most notably the owner, was, uh, 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 the owner of, this, of this site was proactive in, in implementing some of the deficiencies that are going to be um, Notice tonight through through the abutters presentation. Okay. Um, did we have someone from the, from the police department that was going to speak to traffic a little bit? Lieutenant Landon is here. I don't okay. know if you wanted to speak after the abutters or no, before. I think, I think okay. before would probably be better. Okay. Good evening, Lieutenant. Thank you. Good evening, Lieutenant Dan Landon from the police department. Tonight, we'll, uh, I'll address just safety issues we have, nothing with the land use, the quality of life issues. The traffic study had no major issues on all the projects that are going forward this evening. Our biggest concern with the police department is sight lines. When you're putting in the fences and shrubs on any sites, the, the further they are towards the road, if the people can't exit and have that clear view as clear as they should be able to see if there wasn't anything there, so we want that any sight lines clear so they have the furthest point that they can see without anything there, without any plantings, without any signs, without any fencing. That's our biggest concern from the safety issue. On this project, Salem Street on both sides actually is already zoned for no parking. There's one side, one sign on the side of the store, and there may be two signs on the opposite side, so they could add more signs here, a couple more signs. We don't have, really have an issue there with the parking. We used to, prior to it being not posted, people used to park on the edge of Salem Street. The Abbott Street, there is currently an issue there with parking on the sidewalk. The police department would recommend to the Board of Selectmen, they might want to review and add no parking signs on the store side of Abbott Street. 
to keep them off the sidewalk. Trucks, mostly landscape trucks, other vehicles, they're going onto the sidewalk to leave two lanes of traffic. So they're trying to do the right thing, but they are creating a safety issue by blocking the sidewalk. So at that point, we put, we'd advise to have no stop, uh, no parking signs on that side. On the opposite side of Abbott Street, it doesn't appear to be an issue there if we don't have the people parked on the sidewalk. At Abbott and Salem Street at the intersection, there is a clearing on the edge of the road where the trucks and trailers can pull completely off, and that is fine with us. It doesn't create a safety issue. And concerning Keys Way, we don't have any safety issues with that. That's for the Board of Selectmen to address for quality of life issue, what they want to do, what they want to do on the corner, but that's going to kick it back to the neighbor's house unless they do the whole street with no parking. Uh, the current project has a larger lot, a lot larger lot, hopefully to alleviate all the traffic parked on the street. The entrance, as stated earlier, was moved from Abbott Street further down Salem Street to get off the intersection directly, which is an improvement for us for the safety factors. And on this one, that's all I have at this point, unless you have any questions. Thank you, that was very helpful. I, I guess the, the one question that, that I would have is that if, if down the road there's a problem on Keys Way, is that something that primarily is sort of the, uh, do the, the Board of Selectmen take the direction from the police department on what to do, or how does that work? If a recommendation, but they're solely in charge of placing, yeah. determining whether it's a no parking zone or not. Yeah. Okay. So if there so is an issue, if there is an issue, yeah. we'll give them a recommendation. Yeah. As I said, we don't see right now that there's a safety issue. It may be a quality of life issue for the neighbors, but that's for the going to be for the Board of Selectmen to determine yeah. okay. what their action is there. For the sidewalk portion on Abbott Street, that would be a safety concern for us. Right, got it. Yeah. But again, to clarify, still the Board of Selectmen will have to designate that as no parking. Yes, it's, everything is the Board of Selectmen in their realm for no parking zones. Okay, thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Okay, um, so why don't we take any um, public comment at this point? Good evening. Um, my name is Jessica O'Donnell and I live at 634 Salem Street with my husband James and our three young children. I'm here tonight to address concerns we have regarding the expansion of 695 to 701 Salem Street. I'm here to request of the planning board that in holding with their philosophies to maintain and protect the integrity and quality of life in North Andover, place strict conditions on the approval of this special permit if approved by prohibiting the consumption of alcohol on premise and restricting the hours of operation to current closing hours of operation. Currently, According to the Takis and j and Country Store website, the hours of operation are till 9 p.m. While the particular lot where the construction is being proposed may be located within the general business zoning district, and while Salem Street is used as a thoroughfare for many of us, the area directly surrounding Salem Street, 695 to 701 Salem Street is made up of single family residences. The homes are filled with young children. Allowing the expansion of a business that intends to serve alcohol on premise to customers will put our neighborhood at risk for potential deterioration due to crime, disorderly conduct, speeding, and car accidents. It is common practice to require that alcohol may not be served on premise within a specified distance of schools, churches, playgrounds, or hospitals. There's no reason that this should not also be the case for distance from residences. Our neighborhood is not an appropriate location for a bar or a restaurant serving alcohol. And this is an unprecedented situation in North Andover. Currently, there is no other restaurant serving alcohol in such a heavily settled residential area. Another major concern I have is regarding the hours of operation. Currently, the plaza is only open until 9 p.m. By not placing restrictions on hours of operation, this allows the plaza to stay open later than 9 p.m., thus further affecting the traffic, noise, light, and safety issues that will deteriorate our neighborhood. Traffic at the current plaza creates a hazard for our family while driving and walking with our small children in the vicinity. 
As reflected by the number of parking spaces being proposed, this expansion will result in increased vehicle and truck deliveries going through our neighborhood, which will negatively impact the environment and safety. When large tractor trailers come to deliver and turn into the plaza, it will cause a major backup onto Salem Street. Delivery hours should also be limited to daytime non-peak traffic hours. There are residences surrounding this property and school buses are dropping kids off and picking them up during the morning hours and afternoon hours. And it's also not fair for any neighbors to have to listen to deliveries overnight. This major expansion will create further noise pollution caused by the increased truck and vehicle traffic. This concern is especially acute if the expanded business is allowed to have service, music, and or alcohol sales in an outdoor patio area. A public nuisance could be created or worsened. I'd also like to state that our neighborhood is extremely quiet after 9 p.m. There is minimal traffic. And I think it's fair to say for most of us that we appreciate that piece. The current plans for this expansion also show a large parking lot illuminated by many light fixtures. Saturation lighting of this kind produces glare and can impact the ecology and wildlife. It can also affect neighboring residences. Light pollution will further affect residences by two to three hours more per day minimum if the hours are not restricted. The planning board's philosophy encourages economic growth and the enhancement of North Andover's quality of life. Allowing alcohol consumption on premise, no restriction in, of hours, further noise, safety, and traffic concerns will further compromise the quality of life in our neighborhood. I'm happy for the applicant to respond but I'm truly here to formally request that the planning board please consider the detrimental effects that this will have on our neighborhood. If you don't outright deny this application, we urge you to place strict conditions on the permit, as is allowed by your charter, including but not limited to prohibiting the consumption of alcohol on premise and restricting the hours of operation to the current closing time of 9 p.m. I thank you for your time and consideration and trust that you will do what's best to maintain the safety of our community. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Pat Garvin, uh, and I live at 51 Nutmeg Lane, and I'm here today in support of J&M's proposal expansion of their business. I moved to North Andover in 2006, and my wife and I quickly discovered the convenience of J&M stores. We stopped there for coffee in the morning. We drop by for quick takeout at night when, it's, when we're too busy to cook dinner. When the Columbia disaster occurred last year, we found ourselves unprepared. I had turned off the gas as a precaution like many others. Therefore, we couldn't cook. Everything was closed. If you remember that night, all local stores were closed and traffic was a nightmare, making it impossible to drive to surrounding towns. However, J&M was open for business. So we and a lot of other people on that night all had the same predicament. We were all buying dinner at J&M. Over the last 13 years, I've watched J&M slowly grow their business. And now they want to grow again and at a sit-down dining service. I think this is a great addition to our area. There has been discussion regarding the impact of traffic to the area. Let me first state that traffic on Salem Street is mainly impacted by the number of residents in the area. After driving this road for 13 years, I do not see any additional traffic of any significance brought by J&M and, and the stores in that plaza. If there's one improvement I would like to see, it's the entry, exit, and the general getting around of the parking lot. And I'm happy to see that the plan addresses that issue. As a community, we have benefited by having quick and easy access to convenient items, Dunkin' Donuts, a dry cleaning service, an ATM, fine wines, quick takeout. And more than just convenience, we've really benefited from having access to these services during challenging times, such as during a snowstorm or during the Columbia gas disaster. JNM has grown their business to provide all these services. Now they want to offer us more and ensure that their business remains competitive <coughs> in a strong, growing economy. They have purchased the adjacent property for their expansion. It is zoned correctly for their desired business goals, and I believe we should respect that desire and let them go about this building plan. Thank you.
<laughs> hey, how's it going? My name is uh, Joe Barba, 132 Abbott Street. I've been a resident of North Andover for 13 years and a uh, resident of Abbott Street for the past nine years. In that time, i probably embarrassed with how much money I've spent at uh, JNM and Taki Speeds in terms of just general business, whether it be Dunkin' Donuts, take out for you know, the family, or you know, just picking a quick, up, quick grocery item up. Um, you know, I have two young kids as well. I live on Abbott Street. Um, we've found you know, nothing but value from JM and Takis being in the neighborhood. And I think you know, looking at any further services that are provided by JM, we're looking at it as a welcome addition to the neighborhood. Um, as people have already addressed here, the main concerns that we've had in the past have been parking of commercial vehicles on Abbott Street. Um, you know, I find, as the gentleman before me just stated, that the majority of the traffic on Abbott Street that I see as a problem is not generated from JM or anybody, any business there, but actually from probably people going to and from Sargent School and picking up their children there, where I have a, a young child. Um, so in summation, you know, I think anything that adds value to the neighborhood is a welcome addition for me and my family. And uh, you know, I have no, I guess, opinion one way or the other in terms of influencing you guys, but I just wanted to state my case in support of Jim and Mike and the family. Thanks. See, he got some friends. All right. Hold on, so if you're gonna give us that, you can just give us stuff and then go okay. one and go to the question. All right. So, uh, Mr. Greer, uh, I know we have your presence. Can you, can, you just step back? What, can you just tell us your address, please, sir? 737 Street. Okay. Um, so I know we have, um, you submitted some documents that are in our packet. Um, so we've had the chance to look at those. So I would just ask um, the, any statements you want to make, just keep it to a yeah. couple minutes or less. Okay. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief. Okay, thank you. Um, if you look at this document I just gave you, I spent the last eight days walking around my neighborhood. And not only do I speak for myself, but I speak for 38 other families between Nutmeg and Summer on Salem Street, Nutmeg uh, Periwinkle, Nutmeg to Salem on Abbott, North Cross from Ab uh, Abbott to Ray, Easy Street, and Keys Way. There are 76 houses or less in this neighborhood. And as you saw in my um, presentation that I submitted, 38 voted against this or signed this petition. I for few voted against this. Two voted for, three abstained, and four wouldn't talk to me at all. <laughs> so with that, I'm not gonna sit here and argue with uh, setback zoning and all this. I wanna talk about our right as a neighborhood to pursue our own endeavors. Why is it that we can get together as a town and vote down this Lucent thing last year and we as a neighborhood can't vote down this. Now, statistically speaking, we have won the day with the neighborhood, all right? We were 38 votes to two, well, now 38 to four. So I would concede we go from 96% against to 92. Overwhelmingly, our neighborhood is against this. Quality of life, parking, safety, if you look at my report, you see trucks up on the sidewalk. There was one on the sidewalk today. My favorite picture is the tree bucket truck parked right in front of the no parking zone that um, Lieutenant Lannon had mentioned. All right, parking, no parking signs are there. They don't mean a damn thing. All right. Yeah, could you start going through a few slides? We're not going to do an entire slideshow. Okay. I'd, I'd like to, to, you saw the picture of the slide with the horse trailer up on the sidewalk? Yep. No. Officer, if you got a tractor trailer towing horses parked on the sidewalk, would you consider that a nuisance or a danger to the pedestrians? So, so it, you can just make your point. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make my points. I'm really not good at this stuff. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. You've made it. A, but a anyway. Very thorough presentation. And I the, think the we understand what you're. Yeah, the Where fact of the matter from? is, you know, this is our neighborhood too, all right? This business, <coughs> second, yeah, all right. Anyway, this is a, just a. So, so what, what, can you clarify that? It was 
submitted yesterday. So when the agenda got posted, it wasn't there. It has since been added, and it's in hard copy to the board so that they have it. Okay. So anyway, the point I'm trying to make, sir, is this neighborhood doesn't exist for the benefit of JMW. This is all our neighborhood. And like I said, the majority of the neighbors do not want this. All right. And like I said, I've given you the, uh, you recall, there the petition signed by 38 of my neighbors. I even went as far as giving you the two that abstained. Actually, three abstained, but he just sent me a text. All right. So this is clear beyond a shadow of a doubt that our neighborhood doesn't want this. And if we want to statistically go out to the rest of the homes, we're still going to carry the day by 80%. So uh, I guess I'm not sure if, if, it's as, if your point is rhetorical or not, but it's not something that's subject to referendum, right? You, so no, no, no. The point is, yeah, it's, it's right. I guess it is rhetorical, sir. Okay, I'm ju I right. just wasn't sure. I know, because the <laughs> point I was trying to make is we got together as a town and voted on this loosened thing. This, this isn't a special town meeting, sir, but this was our town meeting. Our neighbors spoke by signing that petition. Let, let me ask you a question. It's probably a different way. I'm not, it won't try to be difficult, but if you went around and took a poll the same way of the existing thing, probably everybody would vote the same way, right? I'm sorry? Of the existing uh, commercial uh, project on the site. You, you would end up with the same answer? Maybe, maybe not. I, I frequent the place, too. I use the dry cleaner. I find it a convenience. What I don't want is a 12,600 square foot building in and around a neighborhood with buildings, with single family homes, with, with footprints in the 1,000, the 2,000 range. I mean, this is not a piece of architecture that's gonna add to our neighborhood. It's gonna stand out like a sore thumb. I mean, it's it's, I consider patently absurd to say that this actually fits in our neighborhood. Right? And like the woman said from 634, who was one of the very first ones to sign my petition, we don't want an you know, serving alcohol in our neighborhood. And people buzzing down Abbott Street after they've had a few pops, staying up watching the game, whatever. You know, this is this is our neighborhood too. Okay. Thank you. Okay. No. We should all go take a look at that presentation. Can I ask the applicant a question? I, 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 I want to get the sizes right. What is the size of the existing structure and what's the size of the proposed addition in terms of square footage? It's, it's the addition of 8,700 plus 3,900. That's so already there? Yeah. So it's, okay. Well, there, there's a portion of, of the existing that's being taken down. So what is it today? Where, what's this total square footage today? It's like 4,300. 4, and when the smoke there is, it's how yeah, much? Yeah, it's 55, and then, and then the new is 12,3. Okay. And, and keep in mind, we're also adding an additional lot to it, of course. Right, no, 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 I understand that. And both lots are zoned for general business. Correct. But I just wanted to get the, the delta in the size of the construction. I'm uh, James O'Donnell, 634 Salem Street. My wife actually just got up a few minutes ago. I just wanted to make kind of two quick points that I'm not sure if anyone else has said so far. Um, regarding the parking situation, you know, everyone's talking about, you know, they're expanding the 70 space is going to alleviate the, uh, the traffic in the area. But they're not talking, but if there are 70 spaces at the existing location today, there'd be no issue with parking. 70 spaces when you're more than doubling the size of the building, it's an open question of exactly what the effect's going to be. I don't know if there's going to be an, if that's going to solve the issues of access to Salem or parking on the site. The other thing I'd like to know is kind of the unique nature of the business district. Um, so, like where JNM is today, if you kind of look at the zoning board and you kind of look where we have business districts zoned in town, it's very unique. It's more than a mile from the nearest business district, and there's no one spot in town that's like that. The majority of business in town is located on. 125, 114, Mass Ave, Main Street. 
there is nothing nearby here that kind of offsets it. So it's a very kind of, it is, it's a unique business district in a heavily residential area. I mean, I think the current business is great. I will admit I go there all the time. If the six packs were a dollar cheaper, I'd go there more often. <laughs> but yeah, I can walk there from my house. I do appreciate what they do today for me. Um, I just, I get concerned if we're talking about taking something that's reasonable and sized for the neighborhood today and expanding it to something that is, well, again, it's more than twice the size. It's going to change the character of the neighborhood. And it doesn't line up with anything else in any other business district. It's, there's no similar business in town to really kind of measure off it, but it, it seems drastically different than anything else we have anywhere else around. That's yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I just have a quick comment. My name is Karen Robbins. I live at 20 Nutmeg Lane. It's the first house on Nutmeg. A um, couple questions. I, when I moved here, I didn't. I loved JM. It was one of the reasons we came from the city, so we had a little place to go. Never realized the building to the right of it was zoned mixed use. And um, as I guess they've purchased that house, that na that house has become sort of a parking lot. So my question was, what are there any restrictions on making sure that Jim, your house, the next house, I worry about where the park. If if there are 70 places for people to park, where are all the workers going to park? Is that going to become in your driveway? Is that going to extend down the street? Secondly, I'm the one who mows the lawn on my street, that land that I don't own, but I take care of it, constantly picking up Dunkin' Donuts cups, nips, constantly. So my question is, is there any anything we could put in place to make sure that the neighborhood, if it's impacted really negatively in terms of garbage or drunk people walking up and down the street, is there anything to make sure that doesn't happen? as one who already does pick up after the folks from j &M, not the people who own it, but the people who go there. Something just to think about for the planning board. Thank you. The, uh, the employees park in back generally, right? Yeah, so it's my understanding the employees park in back uh, in terms of the trash. I mean, as far as I know, the Dunkin' Donuts itself isn't changing. The other aspects, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure what we can make as a condition, but we'll think about it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, at, at one level, it's something that's a little bit impossible to police, but I think it's sort of in the spirit of good neighbors. You got you got to try to figure out a better way to reduce the litter. I mean, somebody leaves the site and throws the litter out the window. There's nothing you can do about it, but at the same time, maybe there are some things to mitigate it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we don't have a draft decision for today, but I think at least I be interested in hearing people's thoughts on what we should put into that draft decision. Um, some stuff that has come up. Uh, well, first, I, I do want to say that, at least for me, I appreciate that um, the applicant has uh, attempted to listen to the comments that this board has made, and more important, and just as importantly, to comments that neighbors have made and incorporated those into the most recent design. So they changed the parking, signage on the parking I really like, working on screening. Uh, lowering the building height. I mean, those are things that we said were problems and they've addressed them. So I think, um, you know, th that doesn't necessarily win the day, lose the day, but I think it's important that you went out and did that and we hope that all projects kind of go that way. Not a lot of them actually do. So I particularly really appreciate that you went out and did that. Um, I think we heard from the police department. So uh, to me, the things that I'd want in a um, approval would be that the signage um, that, that there is particular signage for where large vehicles should park, uh, that there is appropriate screening with the fence and or with the um, screening on across the street. So if all the neighbors that are affected agree to the screening across the street, then, then great. But if they don't, then there should at least be a fence, maybe both. And I'd like to hear what people have to think about that. Um, in terms of hours of operation, right now there are none, like none official. I don't think it's are, I don't think we were the right people to make that decision. I think the licensing board, if they're applying for a liquor license, they can determine whether or not they should get a liquor license, what hours they should be. That To me, that's a licensing board issue. And I think, yeah. one, I don't think we'd have the authority to just say no alcohol. I think that's out of our purview. Um, but even setting the hours in terms of a liquor establishment, I think that's the licensing board's uh, role. So 
I, I would be hesitant to, to establish anything there. I don't know what other people thought. I mean, again, making sure that the lighting matches up with the design, going back, checking those things. So those are things that I would want. Is there anything I don't know if there are people have comments? John? I, I think one thing that I would like to see, which I think we've started to do with a lot of our site plans, because you can't dictate literally every single theme you want to have happen, is to have a series of reviews uh, on a semi-annual or annual basis for the first few years after the uh, project is in operation to look at the all of the issues that we really talked about, to look at the traffic, to look at the parking, to look at the litter, to look at the lighting and so forth, and see if there's anything that we do to adjust. I, I think also there's part of this obviously is not within our domain as you uh, suggested that the Board of Selectmen uh, and the Police Department have greater responsibility than we do over uh, off-site um, parking and issues like that. But if we can have a forum uh, periodically, I think that gets those issues on the table. And, and I think it's important to do that. So that was something I think we've started to put in a lot of our decisions. I think we ought to do it again. Um, I think your point, uh, on hours of operation, I agree with you to the extent that it involves liquor. Uh, that is, you know, we, we can't uh, put in a condition uh, of our decision. No liquor is allowed. That's not our jurisdiction, as you said. But even hours of operation, I agree with you. I, I think in general, I, I'm a little bit more willing to put some constraints in it of like hours of truck delivery and things of that nature just to mitigate, um, you know, somebody coming at 5 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock at night. I don't think that would generally occur, but I, 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 I think we should put something in our decision related to that. Can you get us something or to the board about what your plan or what your general hours for delivery are? So, assuming that Currently, or what, we would be what we what you would be anticipating. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the point was well taken. That deliveries at midnight would probably be bad for everyone in general. You know, um, so when you would be anticipating deli more more for the delivery trucks than than yeah. hours. What time do those deliveries take place? Do you, do you um, know? Long before I wake up. <laughs> okay. Is anyone? Is between three and five. Okay. All right. N and nighttime deliveries? Do you have night? No. Okay. So maybe we look at the nighttime. I mean, I think the nighttime is more. Uh, do people read newspapers still? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. has restrictions on delivery times. Like okay, there's do you want to check? store delivery, like bread deliveries can come mm -hmm. before seven, but large tractor trailers not before seven. Okay. And do dumpster pickups as well, so. Do you want to look at, I mean, I think that's a, that would be, a, do you want to look at the timelines that yep. they have and maybe we can incorporate them along, yep. along those lines? Yep. Thank you. Kate, do you, or? I would uh, echo your comments about, uh, it's impressive to see the response of the applicant to the concerns previously expressed and be interested uh, to see if there's any more response on the part of the applicant to the concerns expressed tonight. Um, you know, expansion um, two and a half times the current size is uh, certainly uh, something that uh, has some degree of impact to the surrounding residential neighborhood and and it sounds like you're trying to make that work with the adjustments you've made in response to the concerns. And if there's any other uh, manner in which the impacts to the neighborhood can be addressed, then I think we'd love, I would love to hear that. Okay. And, and again, so. In terms of the neighbors, we, we certainly appreciate your feedback, and I think you've seen, hopefully, and you, some people may never agree with everything, but you've seen at least coming out and making statements has led to changes in the plan. You may want it to not go forward at all, and, and uh, like we haven't even voted yet. We'll be voting on the next time, but I do think it's impactful, but at the same time, like I said, it's not a referendum. I think the reason we have the planning board and people that are neutral is for situations where you know neighbors may not agree because it impacts you differently. 
Um, so I think that's why we have neutral people to hopefully decide. Um, so, so thank you for that. I think we'll continue this until August 20th. I think our next meeting, right? And we'll aim to, we're gonna vote on that date. So, and we'll try to have a draft decision out before that so uh, everyone can read it and make any comments at that time. Thank you very much. All right, uh, so we will now go to, is everyone good to continue? Yep. Okay, so we'll do one more and then we'll see how far we get with that. Uh, let's do, we'll do the ANR 0477 and 505 Sutton Street, request for endorsement of the approval not required plan for the properties located at 505 Sutton Street. Assessor's map 74, parcels 23, 24, and 54. We will do continued public hearing 70, nope, the Senior Center, 1 Surrey Drive, 477 Sutton Street, 505 Sutton Street, and 0 Sutton Street, Town of North Andover, application for special permits, site plan review, shared common driveway, parking on a separate lot, satellite parking under Chapter 195, Article 8, Part 3, Section 195-2.2, Paragraph 21, and Section 195-8.8D4B of the Town of North Andover Zoning Bylaw to allow for the construction of a two-story, 13,500 square foot, uh, GFA Senior Center with associated amenities, parking, stormwater management facilities, landscaping, signage, and other site improvements within the B2 and R4 zoning districts. We're also going to be hearing 505 Sutton Street, Sutton Street Redevelopment, LLC, application for special permit, site plan review, multifamily housing, common driveway, modification of landscaping requirements for off street parking, reduction in parking, construction of a new building exceeding 2,000 square feet under section 195.4.80, 195.2.2, 195.8.8, section 195.8.10 of the North Andover Zoning Bylaw and Mass General Law 40A section nine to allow for the construction of, a three, of three multi-story buildings with associated parking, stormwater management facilities, landscaping signage and other site improvements, properties located within the B2 zoning district. Okay, so why don't we start with the A&R? Has the, uh, the zoning board approved their variances? No, we're back at the zoning board on August 13th, and that's why we put the ANR before you. We'd like to get the ANR endorsed so that if they should grant the variances, they have the lots that they're going to give us. Or assuming they will. It, assuming they will, but it would be in place. That's all. Okay. It, because otherwise, they're in position to grant a variance on lots that are not in existence yet. So this plan okay, if you're doing that very, because I was going to say, if uh, personally, the only reason why we're carving up two lots is because it's effectively separate ownership, yes. but it doesn't, the property does not have to be subdivided. For this development, it would. No, it doesn't, ha but it doesn't have to be. What you could do is you could create easement lines. And in other words, the need for a variance only exists because you chose to formate a lot. Because but if we didn't formate the lots, you wouldn't need the variances. Right, but the town meeting vote was to donate a certain parcel of land comprising 57,000 square feet. So and for the, to authorize the selector okay. to accept a donation of land. So yes, because but because it's a public private and you want to keep it you know, separate. I, I, yeah. I mean, I know it's yeah. Yeah. okay. I mean, I, yeah. I just sort of, I would advocate a different order, but if you think that's the better order, then that's fine. So yeah, I mean, I, I think I think they probably this is a tough one, but I think someone's got to go forward first, you know. I guess. So. <laughs> I mean, let let it be us yeah, this time. I mean, and so an endorsement doesn't necessarily mean it will be recorded if the variances don't get granted. I mean, you could, of course, you could it would be recorded. It, so I suppose if you had. You could undo it or just not record it. And if it, yeah. if, okay. if it doesn't go through the approval, it won't be recorded. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about our lots, and our frontage, and our access. I think Scott Cameron will. Hi. Good evening, Hi. Mr. Chair. Good evening. Talk to me about frontage. Uh, good evening, members of the North Denver Planning Board. Um, my name is Scott Cameron with the Moore and Cameron Group. Uh, we prepared the A&R plan. Uh, Eric Loth from uh, Sutton Street Rede Redevelopment is also here tonight. Um, I guess getting back to uh, Member uh, Simmons' comments uh, of endorsing this plan, it's really of no consequence. Uh, we can come back and adjust or extinguish or do whatever we want with these lot lines uh, over time, if a variance isn't granted or something doesn't happen, it's really of no consequence. Um, uh, so in that regard, what we're here tonight uh, requesting your uh, vote uh, of endorsement for is that this plan does not constitute a subdivision under the subdivision control law 
thereby making it uh, an approval not required plan. Um, these, the test for that uh, in this case uh, is that it does enjoy frontage on a public street, Sutton Street, uh, in this, and we have the uh, zoning minimum in the B2 district. Uh, we exceed the frontage, uh, which is 125 feet, uh, providing 253.71 on lot 2A and 271.29 on lot 1A. Those would be the two new parcels created uh, from the existing three that are the Knights of Columbus property and 477 Sutton Street, which is a two-family dwelling. Um, the lots do comply uh, with every other aspect of the zoning bylaw, uh, with respect to dimensions and density. Uh, even with the existing buildings in place, it still complies. Uh, however, it should also be noted that by endorsing this, you are making no certification of zoning. That's the certification that is right below where the board would normally sign. Uh, so happy to entertain any questions about that. Uh, and this is the first step. We do need to create these lots in order for the zoning board to grant relief, should they choose to do so, uh, to a lot line. These would be the lot lines, and they are the same that were approved at town meeting um, for uh, potentially future donation to the town. And these lot lines are created so that we have both a town of North Andover parcel eventually where the senior center would be correct. owned by the town, correct? Correct. And then a separate parcel owned by the developer uh, where the multifamily would be, and that's why correct. we need multiple lots. Correct. And I don't yeah. know, Gina, if you have the warrant plan still in the file, but um, I did provide it here. Um, so you can see the general orientation with the purple line. This is the same exact line that was presented at the town meeting, which now appears here. Does the creation of the lot make you want to create any sort of variance with the zoning board? That's what I was just going to say. It's Derek Wells from Sutton Street Redevelopment. The irony is they said, gosh, now you're creating your own hardship. I right. they said, well, so it's kind of a chicken and the egg. We were creating this to donate the land, but at the same time, then we have a setback <laughs> issue for the lot. So it's kind of going around in circles. Yeah. So, right. Yeah, so, you're yes, right. it you're does. Right. Yeah. But the idea is that, I mean, there's this significant public benefit that everyone voted on at town meeting from doing this via public and private, right? So if they want to just keep it all private and not donate the land, then yeah, they wouldn't need a variance. Um, but I think that there's some good public policy behind why they're doing this. Now we're just, and that's I guess all an aside, that we're just voting that this plan meets the requirements, that it, uh, it's not a subdivision. That's all we're doing, but I hope the zoning board does consider the um, reasons why it's being done. I think, I think the question that they were wrestling themselves with was, if you're creating a setback issue from yourself, is that really an issue as opposed to creating one with an, an external lot? Yeah. Well, you would think that the neighbors, being yourselves, would not have an issue with it. <laughs> um, okay, uh, does anyone have any questions about or comments about the ANR itself? No, I think it's fine, uh, although it is funny. Uh, you didn't specify the three old lots number. Do they have existing, um, uh, like, the three old lots? Uh, do they have numbering? Yeah, from, uh, <laughs> we wrestled with that a little bit. So you have a, a combination of a series of subdivision plans that created these three existing lots going back in time. They had different lot numbers. Uh, I believe there was a one and a two, and then there was another two. Uh, so in this case, where we're extinguishing those lines, it's of no relevance. We just renumbered them 2A and 1A, which don't exist in any of the subdivisions from the former lot. So it creates a distinct uh, new lot identification in the chain of title that somebody can pick up 100 years from now and they can see that change. I, I mean, I'm fine with that, although it's funny. I, when I first joined this board, there was a real estate attorney who chastised you for not doing it the way he wanted to do it. So, uh, but I think it's okay. Chastising. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, Gene, what's our motion here? Is it to uh, uh, recommend that you sign the format? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To authorize the planner yeah, to sign, to endorse right. the plan. Okay. Someone want to make uh, that? Yes. Uh, I make a motion to uh, recommend that the uh, planner endorse the format plan. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Approved. Great. All right, so let's go to, we'll continue with the public hearings. So where do we stand, Jean, with our public hearings? ...immediately quick update from the senior center. Um, essentially, there's no new information tonight other than what was submitted in the plan set. The geometry for the exit onto Surrey Drive has been curved, um, which the board recommended as they thought a good idea last week. 
I'm sorry, last hearing. Um, that has gone out for department review. So although it's in your packet tonight, it's been sent to the fire department especially, but to all departments to review that, as well as responses to the peer review comments and the department comments. The response has been submitted um, this past Friday to all departments, so we're waiting to hear from their comments back. I anticipate um, all of those comments should be addressed satisfactorily by the 20th meeting. Okay, so I, I, I think that's great that they changed the curve of the driveway yeah. to at least encourage uh, that right hand turn only. It's at least a small benefit, but a benefit nonetheless. Okay. From the app. We also talked about a setting up a site visit, and so I wanted to confirm that. The applicants have indicated the 6th, which is next Tuesday, at 6 work for them. And I wanted to get a little bit more detail over your expectations. I didn't interpret any expectations for the senior center site, having that building staked. Um, I thought it was more related to the multifamily, but I did want to confirm that. Okay. Let's talk about that at the end of the <coughs> discussion with the applicant and the uh, members of the public. Okay. Who wants to go? I can go. No, go um, so to update uh, on the multifamily uh, part of uh, this, this uh, hearing, uh, we are working through the peer review comments. Uh, part of that included uh, a site walk in mapping out the drainage system on Sutton Street down to Osgood and where that all goes. So I spent uh, the day today uh, hacking through poison ivy and thorn bushes and uh, if I'm uh, a swollen, chopped up mess by the next, by the site walk next week, you'll know why. Um, we also uh, did stake out uh, buildings, lot lines, and we're getting prepared for the site walk next week, which we can talk about. Uh, so I do expect to have the uh, comments addressed by the end of this week and have a, have a uh, response to everything uh, for the board to review. Um, you know, as I indicated at the hearing, uh, the initial hearing, uh, there's been no comments that have changed uh, the design. We're more fine-tuning and polishing uh, based on the, mainly the Horsley Witten uh, comments on the drainage system. It's taken a little time to get through that. Okay. Um, so one of the big things we asked about was like the stories of the buildings and things like that. Mm -hmm. Any additional feedback you can give us on, on that? We're, we're working on some of that. One of the things we wanted to do, uh, we talked about after the meeting internally, was trying to do two sets of renderings. One would be from the perspective of Surrey Street, and we yeah. wanted to wait until the site visit to go okay. out there and ask neighbors permission. Because if we take a picture from Surrey Street, I don't think it's really going to capture what their view is going to be from the back. If we can access the backyard, take a picture from there, I think that'll be a much more effective tool to show. Fantastic. So we want to do that one, and then we want to do one looking from you know, from where the building would be back towards the houses. Okay. So we'll have those, we should have both of those for the next meeting. Okay, great. Um, and then we also are working on um, a new landscaping plan. I think we talked about a little bit the last meeting. Along the abutters close to where Surrey Street is, uh, we asked mm -hmm. to fill in with more trees and so forth. So that's, I don't know if we have that already. But yeah, it's underway, and I have the trees located that are kind of in that zone between where the building's proposed mm -hmm. and the lot line. So that, that'll be all, all right. So accurate. we did a, a tree survey to show where the mature trees are, which ones will stay and which ones will go. So mm -hmm. we can have that for the, for the sidewalk mm -hmm. and for, I guess, on a plan for next, next time as well. Okay, so glad to hear you guys are working on it. That's great. Um, okay, uh, anybody have current questions? Okay. Uh, any members of the public want to, so I, well, I guess I'll say, so I think you guys want to talk about the site plan, or the site walk, site visit, um, the proposing August 6th, I assume in the evening. That's 6 p.m., so it's an hour earlier. I'm not sure everybody can get there for that time. Works for me. Works. Okay. okay. August 6th, 6 p.m. Okay. So, um, so if there's, do we have a list of abutters on Surrey Street? I imagine that we do, or people on Surrey Street. Do we have the abutter list, which are people within 300 feet, or we could do, well, we can create one for all of Surrey. Yeah, so why don't we create a list for all of Surrey, we'll give that to you guys, and then reach out to those people, if any of them are here today, if anyone's here today that lives on Surrey and wants to talk to these folks, to give them permission to take photographs from your um, yards or houses, I think it, uh, it would certainly help us. You don't have to, you're more than welcome to say no, but. I think it would be helpful information for us to have as we look at this. So uh, talk to them after 
to hearing if you want to do that. Um, and then we'll get them a list and you can talk with anyone you haven't spoken with. Can you point me to the Butter website under the Butter's website? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So, um, so we'll do that site visit uh, August 6th at 6 p.m. Uh, talk, we talked a little bit about this. What that'll entail is walking around the property. Um, it'll be staked out for where the uh, proposed edge of the work is, what trees will be proposed to come down, uh, things along th those lines. Uh, I know some neighbors have said that they'd let us come into their property to um, see from their perspective. We're happy to do that. Uh, there won't be any deliberation at a site visit. Uh, there's no one there to record it. So uh, with open meeting, we can't talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, about things, but we can look and get perspectives. Uh, so we'd be happy to do that. So if you're willing to let us there, you can let us know at that time or you can let us know in advance. Uh, that would be great. Um, so the building corners as well. So I've, that? I've staked the building corners at this time. Um, and uh, we've located all the trees on plan, so when we're there, we can visibly see where the building is, what trees are on which side of the building foundation, and we can we can mark up a plan, or we you know we can take a close look at that while we're there. Okay. Uh, any um, members of the public wish to make comment at this time? No. Okay. Uh, yes. No. No. Okay. You looked like you were getting up. Um, yes. More. Just. Uh, just a recommendation for the site walk. Um, I would wear long pants, long socks, and boots. There's a lot of ground poison ivy, um, so just be safer that way. Or you don't have to go in the wooded area, but that's really where we're going to be walking. So. Yeah, it's thick. Yeah, to brush. Is this a new building? Did we get that mark for any reason? I wouldn't think so. Do we, know, can we yeah. where the would we be able to see where the exit onto Surrey is? Yeah, yeah. That, would be that would be good. Mark maybe, yeah, yeah, mark the exit maybe for the traffic. Okay, so that will be August 6th. Then we'll come back here on August 20th and continue the discussion. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if people want to go keep going or take five minutes and just go right through to everyone. No, keep keep going? Yeah. Okay, keep going. If anybody needs a break at any point, just uh, raise your hand. Okay, uh, we'll travel right along. For High Street, RCG West Mill, MALLC, application for a definitive subdivision approval in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 41, Section 81O, 81T, and 81U, and North Andover Code Section 255. Dash 5.5 to subdivide map 54 lot 1 and map 53 lot 25 into three lots and to create a new subdivision road. This is located within the downtown overlay historic uh, district A historic mill area with underlying IS, R4, and general business districts. Um, also for High Street Avalon Bay Communities Inc. application for subdivision A definitive master plan special permit in accordance with town of North Andover zoning bylaw section 195.18.20. Applicant proposes the construction of a market rate rental multifamily residential community known as Avalon North Andover, consisting of a total of 250 studio one, two, and three bedroom units to be contained within two separate five story buildings, approximately 103,897 square feet and approximately 171,888 square feet, along with an outdoor pool, parking, stormwater management facilities, landscape and signage, and other improvements to be located on approximately 9.44 acres of land is located within the downtown overlay district a historic mill area with underlying is and r4 zoning districts with all buildings proposed within the boundaries of the underlying is district good morning good evening hello hi can you introduce yourself sure uh david gillespie from avalon bay communities i'm uh, vinod kalikiri with uh, tie and barn i'm a traffic engineer Right, David, thank you for coming back uh, tonight. So why don't you give us an update of any sure. development since the last mm -hmm. uh, hearing, and then we'll talk about traffic. Uh, then we'll have um, public comments and um, maybe some discussion with the board. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Uh, again, David Gillespie from Avalon. Uh, 
happy to be here tonight to talk about uh, traffic and transportation. Uh, we respectfully request, last time we spoke, we talked about talking about the subdivision today and on-site traffic and parking as well as off-site traffic and parking. Uh, we're requesting that we just cover off-site impacts tonight only because based on feedback that we've received from this board and from abutters and from town staff and the Conservation Commission last week, we're going to need to make some serious changes to the site plan. So uh, until those changes are done, we think it's premature to review some of those other comments that may have come forth over time. So give us a chance to rework our site plan and, and try to resolve as many of those conflicts as we can and come back to you. That said, uh, the revised proposal will be of a similar uh, use in the sense that it'll be multifamily rental apartments. It will be less dense, it will have fewer units, but um, in that uh, sense, this is a conservative presentation that Vinod's giving today because we'll have uh, less impacts based on his analysis with fewer units. But uh, with that, I know there's a lot of questions and a lot of comments about traffic, so I thought that it was worth it for us to have him speak tonight so that we could incorporate any of those comments into our revised thinking as well as we work on that plan next. So, so that makes sense to me. Um, some things that we're going to have to discuss, and I think we'll do the traffic first and discuss. The subdivision, uh, as of now, uh, we have to make a decision and have it filed in the clerk's office by September 6th. Mm -hmm. So our next meeting is August 20th. Uh, at that point, we'll either we'll need either one of the following, most likely either a um, extension of the date for making sure. a decision, or if the plan's really going to be significantly adjusted, especially with the subdivision and the lots and things like that, potentially even withdrawing it without prejudice and then refiling that uh, if it's going to be different. Sure. You know, um, so you don't have to decide that now, but sure. on August 20th, we'll just need a decision um, because obviously, if you're reconfiguring it, we can't approve this particular. Um, subdivision nor would you want us to um, so uh, we'll just need a decision on that um, I think then also um, so I appreciate that you're going to go back and listen to some of the things that we've said some things that the neighbors have said things that CONCOM has said so it may make sense for members of the board if you have particular thoughts or concerns that you'd like to see addressed in revised plans it may be helpful for you guys to sure. consider because um, it would be um, silly for you to come back and say this is what we were thinking and, and for us to say well no that's not what we were thinking at all <laughs> absolutely you know, to the extent that we can um, okay so great so Happy why don't with uh, all those uh, caveats out of the way why don't we talk yep. about off-site traffic thank you uh, good evening again for the record my name is Vinod Kalikiri I'm a traffic engineer with the firm of Ty and Barn uh, I'm a professional engineer I'm a professional traffic operations engineer with uh, over 20 years of experience working on transportation, transportation planning, traffic engineering projects, not unlike what, what you're uh, seeing today and uh, what I'll be presenting. I'm, I'm the traffic engineer of record on this project. There's a pretty substantial traffic study that was submitted uh, to the town, over 300 pages. Uh, it's dated June 27th. It's gone through a pretty extensive peer review by, the, by an independent uh, consultant hired by the town as well as town staff um, and my goal today is to give you a big picture overview of the traffic study I have about 20 slides or so here so I'll go through the study relatively quickly touching on the highlights but obviously we can get back to specifics as we uh, you know either after the presentation or you can interrupt along the way uh, just given the way the the, the Visuals are set up. I would request uh, Jean to advance the slides as, as we go through. Uh, so just uh, to set the expectations for the presentation tonight, uh, I'll go over the, the scope of the study, how we came about uh, with the scope of the analysis and the study that we put together for, uh, for this project. Uh, uh, relatively in-depth discussion of what's out there today, how the transportation network, the roadways, the traffic, uh, pedestrians, transit, how all of these features are functioning today. Uh, and then I'll talk about project-specific traffic characteristics. What, what does this project bring on top of what, what's out there today? Uh, and then after that, I'll talk about some areas that we have identified as part of this study that, that could benefit from some improvements. Again, that's an ongoing discussion with the town staff and, and with the boards, but initially as part of the study, 
uh, as is typically required. You know, we, we do come up with some recommendations that, that can be considered further as we go through the process. And then I'll wrap up with, uh, with a summary of next steps. Uh, next step, thank you. Uh, so a traffic study in general could mean a lot of things. It could be a simple technical memo that talks about how many cars are on a street versus a very detailed study, you know, very similar to the document that we had put together that looks at a whole series of things. Uh, so the study that we put together, uh, I'm not gonna read every bullet, but it, it touches on some of the key focus areas that are of interest to the town, what we have heard through the scoping process and through some of the commentary over the last uh, several months on what this project means uh, to that neighborhood and to the town. So we, we look at various aspects and, and build the traffic study around those features. The key thing to remember on that is uh, that this is all the methodology and the procedures that we've used for this study are well defined by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation. Even though the project and, and the roadways are not within Mass DOT jurisdiction, the DOT has defined how projects of this type and scale should be analyzed so that there is a common platform for review of this project. So, we have followed pretty much every, every one of those guidelines to the T, and that's one of the things that the TANS consultant has done is to confirm that we have followed the appropriate methodologies and, and our findings are based in accepted procedures. So uh, those are the areas that we would look at. Uh, just a quick overview of the, the scope of the traffic study. There's something with the font there. But essentially, there are the three major steps that we would go through uh, for our traffic impact analysis, transportation planning study of this type. Again, there is an existing conditions review uh, that, that, that is preceded by a scoping analysis. So we worked with the town planning staff, uh, did some preliminary analysis, expanded the scope of the study in consultation with the town. Uh, and then we went out and did a very detailed inventory of what's, what's out there today for the transportation network. And then the third step after that existing conditions analysis is to look at the future conditions with and without the project. So really what, what you're comparing is, is the future conditions with and without the project. So the delta is, is an indication of, of the impacts of the project. And then we would use that delta to identify whether that that increased impact would trigger any improvements or, or if everything works fine. So that's, that's generally the, the framework of the study. Uh, and again, all along the way, we'll be coordinating with the peer review consultant uh, for the town uh, as, as we have done to date. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to read the map, but obviously the site is located right here uh, off of High Street. Uh, where there's an existing curb cut. It's, it's the West Mill uh, complex, commonly referred to as the West Mill. East Mill is, is on the other side of High Street. The town hall is located right there, High School 495. Um, and a key feature for the transportation study is, is the commuter rail station, the, the Lawrence station that, that you see on the left edge of the, of the slide there. So we started the transportation study with uh, a preliminary analysis as we typically do because we want to solicit in input from the town and also for, for engineers to understand how big of an area do we need to study, which intersections and which roadways would be impacted by a given project. So we did a preliminary evaluation that was actually part of the record that was submitted early in May. And then we followed that up with a meeting with the planning staff uh, where we talked about impact areas, what else is happening in town. And with input from the town staff, we were able to expand the study area. And what you see on, on that map, actually each of those dots represent a key study area location. And we, would, we looked at turning movement traffic, a whole bunch of statistics that I, I list in one of the next slides. Uh, but not only the traffic flow on, uh, at each of the intersections, but on the approach roadways to each of those intersections. We look at uh, various metrics to understand how, how the system is functioning. The next couple of slides, uh, 
actually this slide summarizes the, the data that we use. Again, a lot of the analysis is founded in data, uh, traffic counts, uh, you know, daily traffic counts, uh, peak period traffic counts, the morning commuter traffic, afternoon or evening commuter traffic, people coming back home during those time frames. We look at truck traffic, we look at vehicular speeds, sight lines, uh, a roadway geometry and traffic control, whether it's a sign, you know, unsignalized stop sign control or if there are signals, how the signals are uh, operating today, what the parameters are for the traffic signal, how the, the roadway network connects and provides access to the regional highway system. If, if someone, you know, if a resident on, at the site, they were to go to work and, and need to travel south, you know, exactly what, what would be the routes that they would take or what options do they have to travel within the roadway network. So we look at that. We look at crash data. Uh, the Department of Transportation and RMV has put together a very detailed crash database that looks at safety parameters for several years going back and we look at the last five years of crash history to make sure that we understand traffic patterns and crash patterns uh, that contribute to crashes. So if there are patterns, then we can try to address them as part of our recommendations. And, and with these traffic counts, how long does it take you to bring them over? So typically, the, uh, the DOT methodology requires two days of daily traffic counts and uh, one morning peak hour count and one evening peak hour count. So essentially about, you know, again, two days of total count duration. We looked at six days of data going from, uh, I believe, a Tuesday through a Sunday. Uh, uh, typically, usually, you, you, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays represent your typical weekday conditions, and then Saturdays obviously represent a, a, a weekend condition for traffic analysis purposes. So the next chart that you see there um, actually provides a graphical representation of some of the data. I'll, I'll try to uh, simplify the explanation of this. What this shows is, uh, this is actually traffic on High Street, and we have data on other streets as well. A specific spot or multiple spots, where, where would you? So in addition to looking at data at each of those dots that uh, I pointed out earlier, this count is actually on High Street between uh, Prescott and Water Street, so that the section of High Street, it's, it's, it's along. They, the count would be representative of, of, the, of the traffic flow on that section of road. Okay. Um, so what you have here is, is the x-axis is the hour of the day, and the y-axis is number of cars, and, and you know, essentially hundreds of cars per hour. And what you see here in the blue line, that represents the, the weekday traffic, the average condition. Let's say you take the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and you average it out. They're, they're generally plus or minus about the same value. But what you see is this morning spike that's you know, around 7, 8 a.m. in the morning. That's, that's your commuting traffic leaving this area or people that work in the East Mill and West Mill complexes that, that are coming to High Street in the morning. So that's, that's this morning spike in traffic. Similarly, you would see an evening spike in traffic that corresponds to around 5 to 6 p.m. when people are leaving that area if you're working in that, in that uh, uh, either at East Mill or West Mill, or if you're a resident in that part of town that, that you're actually coming back home. So that's the second spike. So generally, as you can see, those are the peak times of the day when, when you would experience the most amount of traffic. And this pattern doesn't matter which road you look at in town. I mean, this, would, this pattern would look the same on Water Street, it would look the same on Mass Ave. Most commuting uh, routes would have a similar pattern. And then there are slight dips or bumps in the middle of the day that corresponds to lunchtime variations. But generally, from a traffic analysis point of view, the weekday morning and the weekday evening peak times are most critical for traffic analysis purposes. So if, if I were to take that 518 that you have there, yeah. uh, it, can I conclude that that's between five and six o'clock, the number between five and six p.m.? Yes. Okay. Plus or minus. Right, yeah. And uh, then you did a weighted average of the days that you observed, right? Right. Yeah, okay. So, yep. And this is uh, 425 or 518. That's the count of traffic uh, in that section of High Street moving in both directions? It's both northbound and southbound. And right. we have uh, 
for ease of our simplicity of this graphic, I added the two, but there is breakdown of northbound right. and southbound. So uh, in how do I interpret in this um, with respect to the site? Oh, I, I have some well, slides that come well, up after this. Finish the question if I could. Okay. With respect to the site, so this is the section of High Street that is between Prescott and Water. And where the site is, if I'm trying to understand, let's just take the morning rush hour, how many cars are on High Street, sort of relative to that site, this will or will not pick up any current traffic coming out of the site and going left towards Sutton. Would that be part of this count? Uh, this, this particular count location would not. And so it's only giving us, you know, I don't know how many people from the site are commuting north on um, high and south on high, but let's just for the sake of making my point, let's say it's, it's split evenly, then this would only give us half of the current traffic that is coming from the site. Now, there's other traffic on High Street that has nothing to do with the site, right? And I don't know what proportion of this current traffic is just from the site, but would, is my thinking uh, okay here? Am I missing something? I mean, it's uh, only the, the capturing a portion of the traffic from the current portion of the traffic from the site. Right, so what, so there are other metrics. Again, this is one of, as I mentioned, this is a representative chart that shows how the traffic flows right. every hour on that section of High Street. If you drew the same data line on the north side of Prescott Street, let's say, right. it would look very similar to this. You know, there'll be a slight variation because there are some. You don't know what the volume would be, but the shape of the curve would be very similar, right? Right, and the volume would be comparable to this. I mean, it would be slightly different, but it wouldn't be. Huh. This wouldn't be 900 cars. Right. 425 could be 450. It could be 460. Okay. But it wouldn't be. Sure. But what, what you will not see if you took account north of the, let's say north of the side drive or north of Prescott, right. is the traffic heading south, right? I mean, so the traffic coming out right. of the site, so I didn't, and Correct. that's one of the points I, I want to make in one of the future slides. You know, when you look at a development of this or any development, the concern is, oh, you have all these residences or all of this office square footage or all of these parking spaces and they're all heading in the same direction. That's, that's not the case. Right. When you have the split, the left and right turns coming out of the site, if you look south of the side driveway, you're only seeing or observing the traffic that's making the right turn. If you're looking north of the site, you're looking the tra at the traffic that's making a left turn coming out of the site. So that's why I was saying that these numbers would not be substantially off. They would be plus or minus in that range from, from the point of view of traffic analysis. So I, I don't want to belabor this too long, but um we, we can revisit this because you, uh, some of it will become very clear when you, see, uh, when you see one of the other slides that has the site traffic on. This is the existing I traffic mean, count. Right, okay. This is what's happening today. If you were to go out on a high street in that section of road, that's what you would observe. Right. Without the, the Avalon project. Is there any way for you to capture traffic on a place like high street that would, wh where there's, I mean, it's obviously, it's all about a site of interest, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any way for you to capture the count uh, on both sides? Because no matter what segment of High Street you pick, like right now it's Prescott to Water, uh, I assume you're still only measuring at one point between well, there. If you measure at the beginning and the end, you would get everything, right? It, like if you have Prescott and Water, you measure Water and measure Prescott, you would get it all. Two places. Measure two places. Two places. That's my point, yeah. Right, and so really, yeah, exactly as opposed so to one spot in the middle. Each one of the dots. It just, it just it concerns me a little bit. And I mean, I'm not doubting your methodology and your yeah. experience, but I think when people look at this, it's very easy, I think, to look at it and say, oh, we understand the traffic on High Street, but with respect to the site, we're really only understanding half of it. Well, one thing I do want to uh, make, so maybe we could go back to the slide that shows the dots, but let's say we're, we're focusing on the two peaks. Again, the purpose of okay. this graphic is to indicate that by far when you look at traffic of this type, you would want to focus on the morning peak, yep. which yep. is the seven to eight, 
and in the evening peak, five to six. Outside of that, yes, there is traffic, but it's much lower. So when you focus on the hourly impact of traffic flow, you'd be focusing on those two peaks. So if you go back to the graphic with the dots on it, so that's, that's where the site driveway is located. Yeah. So we have counts within the study that gives you the exact breakdown of left and right. So you know exactly during those peak hours, and in fact, it's actually two hours in the morning and we count two hours in the afternoon. You know exactly how many cars are making a left turn here, going up High Street towards Sutton, how many cars are making a left turn and then making a right turn onto Prescott, how many cars are making a right turn onto High and going down to Water. So you, you get very granular data within the traffic study for the peak hours. And that's really the focus of the analysis is the right. peak. And that we do not skip or we, we don't look at one section and not at the other. We look at every segment of road where, where there is an impact. Yep. And that's why I was saying, when you look at the count at Prescott at High Street, you know exactly how many cars are going straight through, how many cars are making a right turn, left turn. So there are a lot of metrics built into the study. And the purpose of that chart I showed you earlier is to show that we would want to focus on those peak times, the morning peak well, and the evening peak. I take your point. It tells yep. us where the peak times are very helpful. Just one last question on this yep. point. For this graph, and I keep this slide here now, for the section of the street that this was measuring between Prescott and Water, mm -hmm. what point on High Street did you take this data? So again, these are actually at intersections. So the dots are actually at intersections. So this circle here represents the driveway for the site. So it includes. I'm talking about the, uh, the graph the, that you're showing. So where was where were those numbers taken from? So that's right there. That's okay. somewhere right Good. in that area. Right. Thanks. South of south of the Good site. Right. All right. Thank you. Speed. Do you want to go past the, the other slide? So one of the other metrics that we look at from, again, in the context of safety and sight lines and, and you know, perception of speed uh, is speed data. So we actually, again, have some of these uh, counting equipment actually capture speed data. And what you see here, can I zoom out a little bit? I think it's smaller. Yep, that's good, thank you. So each of these bars represents a range of speed, so this is 1 through 14 miles per hour, 15 through 19, 20 to 24 miles per hour, 25 to 29, 30 to 34, and so on and so forth. And over the entire course of our count, the, the, the entire six days, so we've captured the speed of every vehicle that traveled on High Street, for example, over that section of road for the entire six days. And this represents the, the thousands of cars mm -hmm over the course of six days and the, the range of speeds that those vehicles travel at. And what you see here in the top corner, it's referred to as the 85th percentile speed, which is the design speed for analysis purposes. So you would look at 85th percentile speed is, is, is the speed that you would want to do your analysis at and, and want to understand the impacts of a project. So the northbound speed on High Street at, in that section of uh, High Street is 27 miles per hour and the southbound speed heading towards Water Street on that section of High Street is 32 miles per hour. Again, if you were to take that at a different section of road, you'd, you'd get a different, uh, a different metric depending on roadway curvature and, and turning traffic, but, but yeah. that's, that's a spot and data. Do you draw any conclusions here on why there's such a large variation um, between the north and southbound in five of the six columns? Only one of them is close, the 25 to 29. Everyone else is a wide variance between north and southbound. What is that? What is that telling us? So, again, like, hypothetical. I haven't looked at the yeah. exact causes, but a lot, there are a lot of friction uh, factors along the roadway. Like, for example, if you're coming out of the Water Street, uh, Elm Street, High Street intersection, yeah. you're heading north towards Sutton, uh, Sutton Street, you're essentially heading northbound. You have parked cars that are lining up the, the easterly edge there's, of High Street. Is and uh, south down the hill and north up the hill? North right. is towards the airport. Northbound is towards Sutton, towards Prescott. Is towards Sutton. 
Because northbound is downhill. Yeah, I would so rather move it the yeah. other way. Well, so yeah, well, but that, that, yeah, that's you go uphill going north. They, well, well, yeah, <laughs> but also yeah. The, the part that doesn't make any sense to me is um, the at the intersection, it's yeah. it's a three-way stop, not a four-way right. stop. But going down the hill, correct. It's stopped. so you would intuitively think both going downhill and not having a stop sign would lead to faster traffic, but this does the exact opposite. You know, and the other thing that's kind of strange to me is. There is no stop sign on High Street going through the intersection. You can come uphill, up the hill and then coming oh, down. going uphill. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Again, this is a metric yeah. that we use when we use, for example, sight lines. You know, sight lines are very sensitive to vehicular speed. So when we test sight lines, that's really the purpose of this is to understand uh, if there is a speeding concern. Yeah. So I, I think that that was one of those exactly backwards. It's the stop sign. If you made it a four-way stop sign, it would be slow. Peter, yes. if you put a, made it a four-way stop sign, yeah. you would be closer. The speed would slow the speed down. I think it's a combination. Yeah. Of so the the posted the posted yeah. speed. Sometimes somebody parallel park it, and so you're yeah. slow it down to so let them park as well. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we why don't can we move to the analysis findings? Yes. Yep. So if we can uh, go to the next slide. Uh, and this is another data set. I, I just wanted to kind of show you the type of information we use, the, the, the various well, yeah. crash locations and, and the type of data that we look at to understand crash patterns. Yeah. Uh, then when we look at the project's traffic characteristics, we take a whole series of factors into account. We look at how close it is to the regional highway system. We are about a mile away from this site to get on to and off of 495. We are about a mile and a half from the commuter rail station. Not, not a lot of uh, communities or developments have uh, you know, proximity to a commuter rail station that provides convenient access. There's a uh, bus service on Main Street that, that, uh, that provide MVRTA provides bus service on Main Street within walking distance of the site. There's actually Boston bus starts at the site and heads to Boston in the morning and then comes back in the evening. So there are a whole series of- Are you drawing some form of correlation that because commuter rail is one and a half miles away, that people are taking public transportation to get to the commuter rail? So we have not taken, again, we'll, you'll see some of I the think metric. another data point that would be interesting to me is of everyone taking that commuter rail from that station, what proportion are driving themselves and using the parking garage versus the proportion taking public transportation? Because if they're driving, the proximity of that commuter rail has really no impact on this, right? Because you're still driving. So the purpose of this metric is to indicate what's available within proximity to the site. The analysis is based on taking no credits. We have not taken any credits for public transportation. We have not taken any credits for bicycle and walking. And as, as Dave mentioned earlier, it's a conservative analysis in the sense that if the density on the site goes down, this is based on 250 unit development mm -hmm. and the numbers likely will go down. But again, this is just to indicate what's available uh, at the site. And again, given the retail and multiple opportunities that you have within walking distance of the site that not a lot of developments have, you know, you can expect a certain level of walking and biking, you know, either during off peak hours, nights and weekends, but again, we have not taken any credit for, for these uh, alternate modes of transportation within our analysis. Uh, so again, a, a quick overview of, of what we found with, uh, with, with our analysis. Again, a lot of the data is built into the traffic study that we can get into specifics, but it's all based on accepted mass DOT methodologies that's been confirmed by the town's peer review consultant uh, the second bullet is something that may be related to somewhat what you are asking about. When you look at the census data, and again, that's one more piece of information we look at. When you look at census information for North Andover, you can actually get census transportation data that tells you how many people take public transportation, how many people carpool. It's, 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 it's provided for every community in the country, and when you look at it, approximately 12%, plus or minus of, of, of residential traffic in North Andover does not use a single occupancy vehicle for commuting purposes based on census data. Theoretically, either it's transportation, work from home, uh, carpools, 
two people carpools, three people carpools. There, there are multiple metrics that are available within the census database. But when you look at the data in aggregate, you know, you could say that right off the bat, 12% of the traffic would not contribute to some of the, the impacts in the areas that, that we are looking at. But again, while we quantified that metric, we did not take credit for that number. We analyzed as if everyone's driving uh, a car Do to and from this. I mean, that, that number is now probably nine years old, right? Do you think that number is increasing or decreasing uh, just it, based it, on your experience? It changes from community to community. I expect it to be s slightly different when the next census comes out. Mm -hmm. But again, that's one more. I mean, if, if you're within a walking distance of a commuter rail station, that metric would be very well, relevant they, for analysis. Walking, so we don't have that in this case. So we right. we do not account for yeah, it. Yeah, no, I know. I, you didn't take it's not part. Yeah. I know you didn't take. Chris right. says you didn't take credit for it as part. I'm just curious if right. that number, if your experience says that that number yep. is changing. I mean, it's interesting to think. Oh, I mean, some people like might take an Uber to the commuter rail, right? Yeah. But that still it's a trip in. It's at a least trip. a trip in and a trip out. It's the yep. same. Uh, but it's you know you, that that was my question. Right. So again, when you take the overall traffic estimate for a development of this type, and again, acknowledging that not every car is going to drive in the same direction on the same section of road. You know, they, they kind of distribute as they come out left and right, and then you get up to Sutton Street, you make left and right, or you head south, you make left and right at Water and Elm, or go straight, straight through towards Green Street. When you look at any segment of road and you quantify the amount of cars, the estimated number of cars from this development that would travel in various sections of the roadways that we are looking at, you're looking at anywhere from order of about five to 30 cars on different segments of, of roadway. So can we drill down on that? You start with 250 units of housing, right? Yeah. And you assume a, what's the next step? A certain number of car trips per household per right. day? Or I'm just trying so to- So there are national statistics that looks at know hundreds of residential developments across the country and they're based on either urban or suburban locations so because urban has a different characteristic than suburban so we use suburban data for mid-rise uh, multi-family residential which this qualifies as you know up to 10 stories okay. high is, is what that data right. set contains got it, got it. and it projects the number of cars per unit and then you would okay. multiply the number of units with the number of cars per unit that will give you number of cars per hour. Well, okay. Well, and that's what I wanted out. to get is you get the number of units, the number of cars per unit, that gives you the total number of cars. And then what I'm trying to do is then translate that into car trips and then car trips spread out over the course right. of the day. So you'll see one of the next slides if you if you were to go to the next slide. That's that's what is referred to as the distribution. Again, this is uh, a census-based analysis where using data for North Andover and, and understanding the travel patterns and, and ease of commuting within the roadway network, we identify the percentage of site traffic that is destined in different directions. And this is- I guess what I'm getting at, this is intuitively what I'm thinking is you, you measured you know, at a point on High Street, mm -hmm. what the existing flow is, and maybe it needs to be tweaked slightly, but, you know, the peaks were 400 and 500. What I'm trying to understand is at, from the exit point of the site, during uh, peak hours, how many cars are gonna exit? And in other words, mm -hmm. what you've done is you've spread it out, but I'm trying to understand that of 250 units, so many cars per unit. How many people during rush hour in the morning are gonna leave the premises in total? So if you look at, again, this is based on the national statistics projection, it's 84 cars in one hour associated with the development in the morning, majority of which will be leaving. There'll be a few cars that are coming right, in for whatever enough. reason, yeah. but majority of them are leaving the site. And then in the evening, it's about 107 cars that most of which would come back. Some of them may be exiting, you know, people that are already within their unit may be leaving for whatever reason. But but the perception- Where are those numbers on your presentation? Uh, those are in the traffic study. But so not on the presentation. I, the, you might have that in, in one of the other charts. So what I did was I took the, the hourly numbers and I added them. So what you see there, 
is that previous chart that had that hourly traffic pattern. Yep. This shows the hourly, tra again, if you're looking at that section of High Street, this is, the blue line is the ambient traffic flow on High, on high Street, independent of this project. And the little orange bars that you see on top of it is the contribution of the project on that section of High Street. Hey, right. hey. And then you. Yeah, uh, please, please let us finish because we're going through it very methodically, and we can come back and ask questions. Right. Yeah. So if you if you were to go to the next slide, we have, have a similar chart again based on the distribution analysis. If you saw the same thing on Water Street, for example, I, mean, I haven't presented Water Street until now. This is again the blue bars. Water Street has less traffic on high than High Street on a typical average day. Uh, I made, made sure that the scales are the same so you can get a relative idea of the difference in magnitude. But again, the orange bars represent the contribution of site traffic from the Avalon development on Water Street west of High Street. Is it fair to say that the impact of the site on overall traffic is going to be greatest right at the point where you exit one to High Street. That is correct. Yes. And then it disperses as you get, because as a percentage of the total traffic, because traffic is coming exactly. from a lot of, okay. So am I fair to say though, right at that point of exit, if there's 80 leaving in the morning and the peak is today 400, let's say, just as for, for math. That's 80 over 400, that's 20%. Right at the at site that track. point. But right. then as you move away from it, at it Prescott, disperses. It disperses. Okay. At Sutton, it disperses. At Water, it disperses. Okay. So and if you're living on any section of High Street or on Water Street or Elm Street, you'll never see the, the full magnitude of the traffic coming out of the site because they're all not driving the same but direction. But the closer you are to the site, right. uh, the higher that relative percentage will be and the maximum is right at that point. And right. it looks like it's ballpark at peak about 20% increase. At that particular location that you yeah. mentioned, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But again, when you, so that's when you look at, so that what we just talked about is, is just the traffic volumes. Then there's a whole series of analysis that you do to understand what those numbers mean. You know, whether you have a stop sign control or a signal control. What's the delay today? How, how long does a car have to stop at an intersection? And how many more seconds of delay would the added cars add to that network at different locations? And that's built into the analysis and that's something that the peer review consultant is reviewing at this point. So that's where you understand the impact of the project. Can you uh, repeat for me, did you say 80 cars additional? In an hour. 84 cars. Additional. Coming. Is that in the morning or in evening? The morning or in the morning peak hour. morning. Uh, 80 cars exiting? Uh, total entering plus exiting is 84, but I would say 90, 85 to 90% of those are exiting cars and in the morning. How do you derive the number 84 for that one hour in the morning? So that's based on the national statistics that where the state and, and federal guidelines, they, they look at uh, hundreds, hundreds of residential developments of similar type, depending on the size of the development, number of units, and, and whether it's urban or suburban. And there are rates, trip rates that are developed that says, you know, of, of a particular land use type of, and this applies to office, retail, any other so project. So based on the national statistics, a development of 250 units would Generally. yield so many cars Trips depending on whether it's urban or suburban and that's what that you mean by national statistics. That is correct. The Institute of Transportation Engineers yeah. which is a national guidance that's yeah. used by all traffic engineers in the country to estimate traffic flow from developments. Uh, that's the guidance that, that we use and that's recommended by the state so for I, analysis of projects. Just so I, as I get it, it's how many units and how many cars are going to be in those units and based on the type of use, what type of trip percentages we would be seeing, those multiplied and that gets you your trip. You look at entering versus exiting. Well, and, and how does the analysis factor in? Let's, let's say you have a road that has a capacity of X and you're gonna dump 20% additional cars 
onto that road, but you're dumping that on at the point in time where the road is only bearing half of X. So the impact of that 20% at that point in time is minimal because the road is nowhere near its capacity, as opposed to dumping the same 20% onto a road that is at that point in time at X. So it's full capacity and you're dumping 20% on. So the comments you made a few moments ago about impacts of wait time and lights and stop signs, that's gonna vary dramatically depending on the additional percentage of cars that you put onto a road um, contrasted with what is the current state of the road at that point in time. Is it at capacity, near capacity, low capacity? And how does that factor into your analysis? How do we know, for example, that the 20% addition in one hour in the morning, is that going onto a road that's already at capacity? So or is it going onto a road in that one hour that at that point in time, we know based on national statistics that that road's only at 50% of its capacity, so it has plenty of room to absorb that additional 20%. It seems to me that that's key to us understanding this. It is, it is. And again, the state guidance requires us to look at this as a worst case. We look at the very peak of that roadway traffic curve, and we assume that the peak of the site traffic happens at the same time, just to your Yes, point. but just because that's the peak of the traffic, how does that, how do we interpret knowing whether or not that section of High Street is at its design capacity at that moment in time or not? So the analysis is based on, again, you might have heard this concept of level of service, yeah. like a, a through F ratings that you might have heard on, on other projects. So A indicates a roadway, I mean, again, this um, in simplistic terms, at, at an intersection, a level of service A almost implies free-flowing traffic, that there's no delay, cars are waiting. I understand, I've seconds. never seen it, but F, I understand. F that. is failing condition. Right. So we would run that analysis without the project for the side driveway intersection on High Street, for example, to see what that rating is today without any side traffic added on top of it. So that'll give us a metric on what that intersection is operating at. And each intersection, each leg of an intersection will have a different metric. And you know, the traffic study has very detailed metrics that shows all those A through F ratings at different intersections. And so at that hour in the morning when we're the gonna peak. put peak hour when we're gonna put 20% more onto it, is it A or F or somewhere in between? It, again, it depends at, depending on the location, but no, no, if you at, want to look at, at the, the site. exit from the site. High Street at the site driveway, if you are coming out of the site drive today, you would wait in the morning on an average about 13 seconds before you turn onto High so Street. So A, B, C, D, E, F. That's B. That's B? Coming out of the site, turning onto High Street. At peak hour. At peak hour. Coming out of the site. And that's, that's a function of the traffic volume. When you look at the combination of the traffic flow on High Street and the volume of traffic coming out of the site. And then you would, you would add the traffic. The, well, you would look at three levels of analysis. You would look at what's it, what the operations are today, what the operations are in the future. Seven years into the future is what the state requires us to look at. So we look seven years into the future without the project, without site-generated traffic. And then we look at it seven years into the future with site traffic. Uh, so am I correct in, in, in interpreting what you've said that at the location of the site exit, you're saying High Street is not near capacity. It's not near capacity at the site driveway intersection. Mm -hmm. If you go up to Sutton Street, Sutton at High Street, it's very congested. You'll see level of service E's and F's because, mm -hmm. again, inability to turn left. Are you looking for gaps as you're coming out of High Street? So and as turning? we're evaluating the impact of that extra 20%, we need to be careful not to just look at the exit point from the site, we need to look at places where the road is already stressed and at or near capacity, like the intersection of Sutton Street. And yes, that is true. That's part of the criteria. The other part of the criteria that we use is how much additional traffic would the project add to that? You could have a very congested intersection a mile and a half from the site, 
but if the site does not add a lot of traffic to that intersection, then you know there's, there's no point in analyzing that. So, so we look at it from that In this that point example, given you've got the camera at the site exit and you know exactly how many are going left, going right, yep. going up Chadwick, of the 20% that's gonna go onto High Street at the site exit, how, what, what proportion of the 20% is gonna head up to Sutton? So, well, when you look at the 80 cars, let's look at it that way, as opposed to when you look at percentage of percentage, it gets confusing. Yep. So if you look at 80 cars as, yep. as your round figure number, uh, based on the analysis we have, we have about 30% of those 80 cars that would go up to the, to the Sutton. And what does that do to the rating of E or F at the Sutton intersection? It, it does not change. Because it, the, the, the proportion it's adding is small. The delta, the, those delta. little bars that yep. you see there, yep. depending on where in the network you're looking at, you're looking at those little incremental bars and the impact is not incrementally significant enough. As a whole, yes, I mean, you're looking at 250 units, but at no point within the steady area would you find traffic associated with all 250 cars except at the entry and exit point. As soon as the cars come out, they disperse, left, right, you know, some go down Prescott, some go up to Sutton, some go down to Green. Yep. Okay. We can uh, scroll down. So, the animation is gone. So, uh, what we have done again, based on, you know, what I've summarized in, in about 15 minutes is, is a very detailed analysis. But one of the locations we particularly focused, given the high crash rate, you know, the, the Sutton High and Chadwick Street intersection is one of the locations that has a high crash rate. And, you know, that, that's borne out in the data and, and a lot of the commentary that, that we've heard before. So we looked at what could be causing both the, the congestion as well as some of the safety concerns. And this graphic, uh, this, this animation in here, but looks like it has all of the, the bullets popping up at the same time. Two of the, it's, it's, it's a closely spaced, as, as you know, it's a closely spaced triangular intersection that's made up of Sutton Street, High Street, and then Chadwick Street that cuts through to intersect with Sutton at an angle. The section of Chadwick Street that's between Sutton and High has no control. So there is no definition on who stops or where you stop or, you know, there, there is very limited information. If you're heading north on High Street, there's a stop line. If you're coming west on Chadwick, there's a stop sign. If you're going south on High Street, just as you turn off of Sutton, there's a yield sign. I mean, the, the combination of signs is, is not typical. And, and the markings, <laughs> as, as you can imagine. And then there's an abundance of pedestrian crosswalk signs at every crossing at that intersection. So, and then one thing that I haven't labeled in here is the length of the crosswalk. You can see the, the angled crosswalk across Sutton. That puts a pedestrian crossing Sutton Street, presumably one of the busier roads in this area, for the longest possible time. The pedestrians on the street for a very long time. Uh, you could modify some of those markings. You could modify some of the signage. You could change some of the traffic control. The left turns, for example, coming up High Street and as you all know, if you want to turn onto Sutton, you would see that some cars make a left turn before the island, some cars make a left turn after the island. So there's, there's, there's clearly no definition of what drivers need to do. And one of the things we have identified, again, we haven't resolved it yet, would be working with the town and the yeah. DPW staff to figure out if there are ways to improve that condition with signage, payment marking, directional information so that the confusion is reduced and the potential for crashes is reduced. Basically what you try to do is you try to set up 90 degree angles, right? I mean, that's the large part of the problem here is you don't have any 90 degree right. angles. I mean, there, there are several things that you would look at. You could, I mean, uh, without looking at it closely, you know, you could consider making this section of Chadwick, for example, one way eastbound. And maybe it was like that at some point in the past and it was made two way. But if you were to make Chadwick one way eastbound, if you're coming up High Street, you can't make a left turn. There'll be do not enter signs on that first left turn. So cars would have to come up to the Sutton Street intersection and make a left turn. And then you would mark a stop bar and a stop sign. 
so cars know exactly where to stop, so they're not pulling out into the travel way and, and in harm's way as, as they get onto higher speed traffic. Did so there are various things that you could look at. Did your study that. do anything similar? To, I, I find this very helpful, thank you, because mm -hmm. um, anyone who's gone through there, I think, has experienced what you've drawn. H have, has your study, uh, it's not in the summary, I don't think, but does the study also look at the intersection between High and Prescott? Yes, actually, if you, it is part of the study, but oh, okay. yeah, you'll, you'll see. There it so is. Th the other location that we've identified as an area of concern. ESP. <laughs> as part of the study is the intersection of Prescott and High Street. And again, you have, you know, you have an island in the middle of the road and you have multiple turning movements that can be made on either side of, uh, of that island. And we, just before uh, coming to this hearing, we had a meeting in the field with uh, DPW and engineering staff to talk about this intersection and, and ways to improve or mitigate the condition. We haven't come to any conclusions yet, but one of the options we were talking about is, you know, maybe there's a possibility of, of adjusting the location of the driveway. Currently, it's, it's located right there, offset from Prescott Street and aligned with the East Mill driveway. Is it possible to adjust the alignment of the driveway better with Prescott Street or maybe you move it in the other direction to separate it more from Prescott Street? So there are pros and cons to moving it in different directions. There are sightline considerations that we need to look at coming down the curve on High Street and the speed of the cars. So th there is a process we would go through to figure out an optimal solution for this that, that works for the town. To some degree, the, the geometry here is again an existing deficiency that requires a solution independent of this project. It's just that you know we are highlighting the concerns associated with, with that location. Uh, but going forward, working with staff and the peer review consultant, we would identify potential improvements that could be considered for for that location. If you go to the last so slide, please. can I go back to an earlier comment? Um, while we're on the Prescott intersection with the site driveway. So I had been asking you what High Street is rated there, and I think you said it was about a B. Coming out of the site and to make a left or right turn onto okay. High Street, it's rated B. And what was wait. the wait time? It's about 13 seconds on an average. If right. you're coming out, uh, it could be 15, it could be 11. No, right. average on an average, it's about 13 seconds. That's existing coming out of the site. Right, and what happens when there's an additional 80 cars at 13 seconds each? I believe that delay gets added by two more seconds, I believe, coming out of the site and making the left and right turns. You, there are gaps, I mean, if you're out there during that peak time, the eight to, you know, let's say 7.30 to 8.30, it doesn't even need to be eight to nine or seven to eight. Right. It can be 15 minute intervals. It could be 7.15 right. to 8.15. If you are there during that exact peak, and a lot of the project team members were actually there yeah. during the afternoon peak just earlier between 4.30 and 6 p.m. Yeah. There are gaps in traffic. Yes, there are congestion issues up at sure. Sutton, but it right at the side kind entrance. Kind of accordions, right? Right. There. So I, I, I think my thinking is not straight here, but just help me understand why it's not right. If, if at the, the peak time leaving the site, we have 13 second wait time on average mm -hmm. per car. If I'm adding 80 cars, why wouldn't each of the 80 cars have an additional 13 seconds each? And what does that do for backing up the cars? Right, so it's not just a function of how many cars are being added to the stop controlled approach. It's how many gaps in traffic you have on High Street. When you say that the traffic is flowing on High Street, essentially there are adequate number of gaps. Now, if the Sutton Street traffic backs up all the way down to the East Mill Drive, and there is no gap, it's just a line of cars just going north. Let's say there was a detour somewhere in town and everyone's being routed yep. on High Street. Then the delay, the level of service would be an F you wouldn't be able to make a left turn coming out of the site. Even if you only had five cars coming out, there is no gap. So it's a combination of number of cars that want to leave and the number of gaps that you have in the street. And the analysis demonstrate right now at that intersection that there are adequate gaps to handle both what's going in and out of that site today and what, what we would add as part of this project. 
We actually went back historically several years back to 2007 looking at historical data. There was actually additional office space on, uh, in the West Mill development back then that's since been demolished. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the traffic counts, we're not talking about adding 250 units of residential traffic today uh, on a, like a greenfield site. There was quite a bit of traffic. When you look at the 2007 data, there were hundreds of cars going in and out of this very driveway, and the numbers have gone down over the years just because so some of that has been demolished. Are you saying that because of the, there's less effect of commercial density on the property, 10 years ago the traffic was heavier? Not heavier than what we are projecting now, but it wasn't zero. That's what I'm saying. Back then, you know, you might have 150 cars. Now you might have 200 cars. Okay. But it's not zero to 200. It's, it's, it's 150 to 200. Yeah. That, that, that's the difference it's trying to draw. So you use on-site measurement to use national and state standards yep. and metrics to come up with your analysis. Do, do you or, or any regulator ever go back and say, hey, here's what you predicted for the future at this site, and a year later, here's what we actually found, and here's how close you were or not? Yeah. We, quite often on projects, we do what is referred to as post-construction monitoring study. Yeah. And we always go back and do, you know, as part of that study, parking, yeah. traffic counts, right. this level of service analysis and at key intersections. Typically, and typically plus or minus 10 percent you, you for residential 10. projects. Yeah, there are certain yeah residential projects. And you are pretty much right on. on and when you on do the, the post-construction, um, uh, you know, looks. Is it typically at six months and 12 months and two years? What intervals do you do that at? Usually it takes, again, after full occupancy, it probably takes for a, re it depends. And on if it's a retail use, it takes, you know, three to three months to a year for numbers to stabilize. For a residential project, after full occupancy, I would say after a couple of months, traffic patterns would be established and you'd yeah. be able to go back and do it. And I would say that those numbers would not change substantially month to month once the numbers have stabilized. If it's a retail use, holiday traffic and other things might affect, but residential traffic's very predictable. And that's where the national statistics indicate very high degree of correlation between what we use in the analysis and what's actually observed in the field. Okay. I appreciate your patience with all my questions. Oh, no problem, that's why I'm here. I just have one and then we'll go to, to people that want to. If this was a commercial project, what would, in general, what would traffic, how would that change from this analysis? What's, how, what's the kind of a difference between commercial and, and residential? So I would say, the big, again, obviously, it's Just a function of the size. Of course. Right? I mean, unit, residential units versus, you know, 85,000 square feet of commercial office use or retail use. But I would say the biggest difference between, like, an office use on this site versus a residential use is the direction of travel. So residents are leaving this site in the morning when all of the office uses on, on uh, at East Mill and West Mill are coming in. So it's, it's complementary in nature. So it's not only a function of how many cars, it's which direction the traffic is flowing. So I would say a residential use with traffic that complements the office use is more ideal, I guess, in terms of traffic flow and analysis than to have office traffic overlapping office traffic. But again, in terms of, again, office Depends uses, on size right, and it's, and it's size usually size about, size. you know, four cars per thousand square feet. So when you look at commercial uses, then you would come up with a different set of metrics. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So um, members of the public, if anyone wants to uh, make a statement or a question or a comment. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, my name is Stephen Whitney. I live on 30 Elm Street, North Andover, which is uh, three tenths of a mile from the site, from the entrance to High Street. Um, and I'm, I'm, all, we're all, I'm also uh, a mile and a half from the other site across from Barker's Farm. It's gonna have 192 units, multifamily apartments. Um, and I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb um, 
with the analysis that only 84 cars are going to come out of that site with 250 multifamily units. I mean, I don't believe 250 family units are only going to have 250 cars. Um, that said, I'd like to quote. Well, I think he said 84 during the peak hour. In the right, in one right, hour. right, I get that. I'd like to quote a study that was done in March on Elm Street by Mark Wilson, and who works for the town of Ando North Andover. Um, and the reason we did this speed study was because um, our Verizon wires were torn down by a, an extra large truck, which has never happened before. Uh, and I wasn't the only customer. There was four or five other customers on Elm Street heading down towards High Street that also lost their uh, service. So the study was done in March. And uh, <coughs> basically, the data box was set up at 33 Elm Street. Uh, where the speed limit is 30 miles per hour. The incoming data was as follows. The total amount of vehicles in a seven-day period was 10,676 vehicles. The average speed of these vehicles was 29.11 miles per hour, and of those vehicles, 1.3% were large vehicles, quote, unquote. The 85 percentile speed was 33 miles per hour. The outgoing data towards High Street is as follows. Total vehicles, 10,654 vehicles. The average speed of those vehicles was 29.62 miles per hour. And of those vehicles, 0.9% were large vehicles. The 85 percentile speed was 34 miles per hour. And they claim they're going to, he claims they're going to assign a selective enforcement in the area to deter any speeders. Um, and I'd just like to add that at the top of Elm Street uh, at Maine, they did change that intersection to deter uh, higher speeds a few years ago. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work. And basically, when people make that turn now coming off of Maine, taking a right onto Elm, uh, uh, I would say seven out of ten cars cross the double yellow line because they're going too fast to stay within their own lane. Uh, just just an, ob an anecdotal observation living where I live. So I'm just, I, I'm all for progress. I'm not, I'm not here to bash anybody. Um, I, I think progress is what m makes North Andover a lucrative and productive community. That said, um, I would encourage the board to perhaps do a little research into the business practices of Avalon and uh, reviews of some of the tenants and their communities after a year of tenancy. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Adam Zimmer, 113 High Street. Um, I have two questions. Can we go to slide 17, please? No, on that. Um, my first is a, a question on the study. Um, we, we've done a couple more. It's, it's the picture of that one right there. Um, there's a significant amount of pedestrian traffic that comes down High Street in the morning. It's, it's kids going to the middle school and the high school. The middle schoolers will continue up High Street uh, where they cross over there. The high schoolers, uh, if they use the crosswalk, will cross over the entrance to Sutton Pond. They cross over and then they go either up Prescott or they'll cut through there. Can you just talk briefly to how you capture that data or is that part of the, so the 13 seconds to get out of there, did that take pedestrian traffic crossing there? Just talk a little bit. Is that, so is yes, that okay? Yes. The, as part of the traffic study, when we did the traffic count at the East Mill and the West Mill driveway intersection, that count also included the crosswalk across High Street. So the data, I haven't gotten into the numbers for pedestrian volumes, the data includes uh, the effect of, of pedestrians crossing the street. Crossing the street, but what about crossing the entrance way to Sutton Pond? Yes, our analysis includes that as well. so the count at the intersection includes 
in addition to vehicular traffic, passenger cars, we pick up uh, pedestrians, bicycles, buses, and trucks. And this is done in May, is that correct? May. So you were capturing uh, school year pedestrians? Yes, that's one of the prerequisites is to do our traffic counts at time of the year when school is in session, there are no holidays, not adverse weather conditions. It's a requirement. And I have a second question, and that is you said you went back and looked at data from 2007, yet I don't see any of the fatality data there. If we look at the bottom right-hand corner on April 27, 2007, Jessica Finley was killed at that intersection right there. If you go up the road, make a left on that corner there at, this, at Sutton Pond, uh, sorry, Sutton Street and Main Street, uh, 2007 as well, there was a fatality there. And then the third fatality in 2007 was over on, on Mass Ave. Again, all of the traffic would pass through uh, in that direction. And I think it would have been useful to, to look at, at that because that, it, to, to me, the other thing is when you look at the, the fatality uh, data for North Andover, the vast majority of it happens on 114, 125, 495 high-speed roads, not these smaller streets along here. And so it would be nice to know what was it about this intersection here on April 27th, 2007, that contributed to that fatality. And, and I'd like to understand that. Is that a fair question? make a general statement about historic data. The crash information that's, that's being referenced predates the mixed-use development that's, uh, that's taken place within the, the East Mill and West Mill. 2007 time frame, I believe, is when, when the property converted hands and, and the new development started uh, going in. Generally, when you do have a mix of traffic, as I mentioned, the complementary nature of residential, retail, and office traffic, that does help mitigate or spread the effect of traffic a little bit. But again, you know, that's just hypothesis. Hypothetical. I mean, I, I, I do not know the exact circumstances under which that fatal crash occurred in 2007. No, that's, why, that's why I said it would be interesting to get that data because it came off that curve there. If that curve's contributing to it, it doesn't matter if before mixed use or after mixed use. If that curve is dangerous, that curve is dangerous, right? You pump in another 84 cars, it's not going to exacerbate that issue at all. Right? Okay. Anyway, thank you. Hey there, me again. <laughs> Robin Morgison, 147 High Street. I just have a few points. Um, can you tell me, you mentioned it was, I think, over six days that the traffic study was done. What, were the, what was the date? When was it done? So the counts, I believe, were done between May 7th and May 12th. Okay. It was long before the Memorial Day weekend. Okay. Um, so, I'm curious as to why the, um, the, the traffic uh, density wasn't, wasn't the, the traffic density, or density is the wrong word, the amount of traffic going down High Street in both directions wasn't, the, the whole road wasn't taken into consideration. Why it was just that piece of the street between Water and Prescott, because that's really not represent representing the total traffic on High Street. Um, that's a percentage of, the high of High Street. And if we're gonna talk numbers and we're gonna say what is the actual impact of this on the residents or the, the neighborhood, it all, uh, isn't all of it important? I'm not sure I understand w why we segmented off just the people who are turning right and left out of the property and not all of the cars that are coming up and down High Street and what that total is. I yeah. think it is because it's. I think you you have like it's like a toll gate, right. and so everything that passes through that toll gets counted. Uh, the point Peter was making is that depending on where you do it, you might miss a little bit of exit out from the site at any point in time. Mm -hmm. But I think it captures. I think your car captured all the through I, traffic. I, I I yeah. I do want to clarify again. Uh, for, for the audience, when we look at the traffic counts at each of these study locations, we are not just counting one leg of the <coughs> intersection, we're counting every movement that, that occurs, lefts, rights, throughs, main road, side street. What you saw and in the chart is just one segment of the analysis. Well, That's another point you made, I, I think, is that every one of those places that was in red 
you, you count the volumes at every one of those? That is correct. Okay, so that's in the, the bowels of the report. You just summarized some of summarized it. Summarized it for yeah. one location. Yeah. Okay. But, but that wasn't represented in the totals that you gave, right? No. That you, the totals that you gave were based on the rights and lefts out of the mill no. I think property, just to, right? Just to clarify, and no one's turning on. I think we, for representative purposes, just to explain the scope of the study, there was one location picked. But if you look at any of those dots that are on the site, we could do a similar chart for those as for well. For the peak hours, yeah. For the peak yeah. hours, we could do similar charts for those as well. Right. So th the point is, th there's a 300-page traffic study. It has all the bigger data. I think they were just trying to give a summary of an example. So yes, it doesn't. That that one example doesn't cover the whole thing. Right. They provided that right. data. Right. It's just we didn't go into each one in in super detail tonight. Got it. Okay. Because you know, as a, as a high street resident. I'm, I'm guessing there are more cars that are coming up and down that are coming from Elm down to go to go to 495 and there are more cars coming up High Street towards Elm and it would be interesting f as a resident to be uh, able to see those numbers because I think those are more you know fa to me those are more factual numbers for what's can really I, happening can I clarify this question I want to make sure I understand the answer do you, do you mind going to slide six So all of these orange dots are the places where you captured data, is that right? Peak hour data. Peak hour data. Okay, now can I ask you to go back to slide eight? So this graph shows the volumes um, at different points of time just for that section of High Street, but in the 300-page report, is there a graph like this for every location represented by those orange dots? No, I, I generated this chart for the purpose of this presentation, but all of the data in 15-minute in intervals, you have detailed data so of how many cars. In the 300-page report, there's no graph like this for High Street, but there is a table of data for High Street and every tables of data for every spot yes. But that must be very difficult for people to read without the graphs. Well, the, the purpose of the traffic study is, again, to come up with what I would call as these networks that you would have seen in traffic studies, uh, the peak hour traffic networks huh. that indicate how many cars are turning at each intersection in different directions. And the impact, and these represent the peak hour number. So there would be a graphic like this for the morning peak and there would be a graphic like this for the evening peak. And then so we were saying look that that graphic is that the conclusion of the study. That it capture it synthesizes the, yeah. the 300 and pages and of data. that's not in the presentation, that graphic? Uh, this graphic is not. This okay. is okay. too fine of a detail to be able to see, but it is part of the traffic study. That is a <coughs> snapshot of one of the legs. Um, a couple other points. Y you talked about the speed, measuring the speed in front of the for High Street. Um, I think, as as a local resident, I can tell you that there's speed discrepancies. I think people sitting here will agree with me here, in that um, as you're coming down Elm Street and you're going down High, there's restaurants there, and there's people pulling over, and there's people double parking, and there's people trying to parallel park, and you have to slow down. But once you get past the restaurants, boom, they speed up. So the, tr the, the speed right in front of for High Street is not representative of the total speed going up and down High Street. I think that's pretty that's accurate that's to that's state. That's an important, important point. And again, I'm glad Officer Lannan is here because some of the stuff is existing conditions off the site. Mm -hmm. But we ought to address all of it. So I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. Yep. That's, that's a Thank fair you. Point. Yeah, thank um, you. And and one other thing related to that area is you talked about there right at that annoying intersection by High and Water where there are three stop signs, and then none, going up High to Elm. I don't know what the actual reason is, but I always figured that it was because when you're going up to Elm, that's a steep incline, and in the winter, in wintry conditions, to try to stop there and wait for the person in front of you to go through the stop sign and then try to get traction to get up that hill might be pretty tricky. 
So I'm just guessing that maybe that's one of the reasons that they didn't do the stop sign for that, for that area. Um, uh, a couple other things. The um, I think we already talked about the point of the train station being a mile and a half. I don't really indicate. I really was struggling to figure out what the purpose of that was, because if they're going to the train, they're likely going to drive down High Street. So that again just says more traffic. Um, and my other question was about the impact on. I don't know how many people have driven down. Um, I don't know if it's called Main Street by the middle school. Is it Main and 125? Um, so if you've ever driven down to the middle school at drop off and pick up times, it's pretty crazy there now. <laughs> and so I'm trying to imagine 80, 100, however many more cars in that area going through that intersection at that time um, is pretty significant because it's already, I drive there trying to get to work. I'm not dropping off or picking up and it's, I think the it's point backed that up. I think is that once it leaves the driveway, it disperses. So it's not going to be anywhere close to 80. It goes by the middle school. It might be 10. Right. You know, it, because it goes in five or six different paths. It, it does. But, but I, would, I would guess that the majority of them will either be going down High Street because they're going to go to 495 or they're going to be going up by the middle school to get to 125. Everything else is really minor. It's like to go into town. You know, so... I mean, it, I think our we'll peak hours, are not gonna, most people, I mean, again, with a residential complex, it's going to work, right? That's what yes. we're presuming. So yes. you can go right and go on to High Street, and from there you can turn on water, you can go up right. home, you can make a left on water. Most people probably won't make a left on water, probably either go straight up home or make a right on water. Exactly. Or you'll take a left. And they're going to go to 125. Then, well, yeah, but right, yeah. and from, from there you'll go either right exactly. or go left. So th I think yeah. the point is that there's at least four different ways that those cars would go. Yeah. Who knows which way, but if you say that it's going to be even the 2020, 2020 sure. over the course of an hour. So right. I mean, just that's the way I think. It, it would have more, certainly. Yeah. But how much more is, is the question that we're looking right. at. And what the impact is on how, as Peter said, how busy the roads are now. Sure. Well, I got another question on that, but I think we got to wait yeah. for everybody yeah, else. And, I'm, and this is my last yeah. point, um, is because I'm not, I'm not uh, really understanding how you get to the 80 or the 100 and you feel like that's that's locked and loaded, but is the town or did the town do an independent study or an assessment of the mm -hmm. this, or will you be? Yeah, so there's a, a review of their report is being done, right? Yeah, so we're doing a review of their report. So okay. if our consultant who uh, town hires and chooses, they pay for, could say, yeah, that data makes sense, that's the data I would have used, if that makes sense, yeah. or they could say, no, I disagree with this point X, Y, and Z. So it's being done. First of all, I would like to thank the planning board for all their hard work they do to keep this town a desirable place to live. My name is Heather Norwood Cole, and I live at 73 Water Street, and I am the owner and operator of Top Notch Cuts at the same address. I am the former owner of Mel's Barbershop, located at 128 Main Street, also the former co-president of the Merchants Association here in North Andover. I would like to start off by saying that my family has had three generations of businesses, including Main Street and Water Street for the last 80 years. I myself have owned my own business for 35 years. I was born and raised here. I am a townie, and I care very deeply about the future of North Andover. I have seen many changes over the years, and I believe in reasonable growth, progress, and development. I believe in our community and businesses thriving. But when you can't find parking all too often, you keep driving and you bring your business elsewhere. I have legitimate concerns about the traffic and congestion which currently exist in Machine Shop Village, especially for our pedestrians, police, fire, ambulance, not to mention the customers we hope will come to town and utilize and frequent our businesses. Countless times I have witnessed on high, Elm, Water, and Main Streets, emergency vehicles having to slow down or come to a complete stop when responding to a call. Streets so congested at times, making travel response times slowed. Not what we want for critical calls. 
not what we want for the safety of our citizens. I personally have seen many car accidents as well as near misses on the streets of Machine Shop Village. I am concerned that beginning an additional apartments to an already congested part of our town could only make the issue of safety worse. Because of the current overcrowding with parking on both sides of Water Street, the norm has become, has become drivers driving down the center of the street. Due to the fact that the road can't safely accommodate cars parked on both sides, as well as traffic moving in two directions. It's a recipe for disaster, and I feel daily that someone will be hurt or even worse. In winter months, Water Street becomes impacted and even more of a safety hazard. The street becomes more narrowed with piled snow. And once again, people who want to utilize and bring us business complain about the narrow roads and limited and or no parking spots available. I've spoken to many business owners on the street and in the area, and we all have the same concerns. If Avalon is allowed to build more apartments in this historic part of North Andover, we as a community may not gain business, and we fear that we could actually lose business due to the congestion and lack of available parking, and with additional apartments safe travel in our neighborhood becomes more of an issue. With, regret, with regards to West Mill Lofts, currently residents of the mill have two parking lots allocated for their use. During the day, the parking lot at the corner of Water and Church Street is filled to capacity, which forces mill residents to park on Water Street. Water Street is two hour parking, not all day our businesses suffer. The parking lot is underutilized by the mill residents overnight. The lot sits more than half empty most nights, which means mill residents park their cars on Water Street, leaving Water Street residents limited parking on the street. Not ideal, not safe, and definitely not neighborly. Can we safely handle an additional 400 plus cars a day coming and going down these already congested streets. This is, this is not including if Sutton Pond closes off their footbridge. If they did, then the traffic would be considerably, th then the traffic would considerably go up dramatically. I urge the planning board to focus on minimizing and regulating the negative impacts on our town, particularly those conditions affecting quality of traffic and public safety. Thank you for your time. Um, I, also, I also have a copy of the traffic report that was done on Elm Street by the gentleman who spoke, and also the police department did one on Water Street, and the, he had already mentioned Elm, so I won't repeat that. Um, but the slowest, the maximum speed on Water Street at one time at nine o'clock at night was 60 miles an hour. The average speed is 29 miles an hour. Um, approximately 400 cars a day are over the speed limit. So how so hard to do as I drive about 2025. Um, there's 3,160 cars a day that go down Water Street and come back. So I will give you a copy of that because it's easier to read than their 350 page report. <laughs> uh, good evening, my name is Don Romano. Um, I'm a resident of 18 Buckingham Road, which is, believe it or not, nowhere near where this apartment is going to be built. <laughs> So the reason I'm here tonight is I'm one of the citizens of the town that has apartment fatigue. Um, and we won't go there because that's not the purpose of this particular meeting. But the, the basic is, is like, this just seems like a really bad location for the apartment. Now, I think, I love statistics. I mean, you can make them do whatever you want. This has been a great slideshow. I can, you know, I can take statistics and bend them at will. But I think what you need to do is listen, kind of feel the smell test. Now, this is a two, 250 unit, really high-end, beautiful sounding things. It's the kind of place that I would love to move into 
when I was like 23, 24, small family, dual income, something like that. There's no way there's 85 cars coming out there during rush hour in the morning. We're talking about one or two cars at least between school and between young professionals going to work. So 85 cars just doesn't smell right. Second thing is queuing theory. When you're, you know, you know what it is like. When you get to an intersection, there's a car stop in front of you and then two cars and three cars. It's not linear. It's not like 10 seconds a car and you're going through it. There's a gap and it gets worse the longer the line gets. So that's not 15 seconds per car. That's going to be, that's, that's why they call it stacked up traffic. It gets longer the more cars you have stacked up. So, but my biggest point is, is that I think that this study is really interesting. It was colorful, it, whatever. And if, and if I saw it in isolation, I'd say, great. But the thing that you're going to have to do as a planning board is you have to raise it up a level. This is a lot more complicated than just looking at numbers and cars going down the road. This is a, this is a complex situation. You need, as a planning board for our town, to look at what is our plan in the next three to five years as a community. And this is all in isolation at a point in time for a single project. You need to say, what are our most important projects? Is this apartment complex in a residential neighborhood more important than the senior center and the apartment complex going there? Is it more important than the apartment complex that is already being built close by here? Is it more important than further development in the mill complex for business? Is it more important than the middle school uh, field project that they're already concerned about traffic studies doing that right off of Main Street in the middle school? So we've got a lot of growth going on in our town and it's great, but the thing is is that this is like, um, you know, it's like liquid physics theory or whatever. It's like the butterfly effect. In a point in time, you can say, hey, this looks great, but you need to really look out three to five years and say, when you combine all this together, you're gonna have to crunch all those numbers and do a integrated traffic study of, well, if I build this here, then, and if I build this here, people are going to change their behaviors and they're going to move around. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna have unintended consequences. So the thing that I really challenge you to think about is, is this the best place for an apartment complex in a busy part of the town? And are there higher priority things that might already affect traffic going on that uh, could so be sacrificed? A couple points on that. One, I believe this study did look at that. It looked at seven years in the future, well, what, what it would be. I, I would ask what they looked at. Did they know about the middle school project? Did they know about Amazon going in down the street on 133? So the future conditions analysis, we need to take into account known projects for which traffic studies have been filed. So and it, I mean, we wouldn't be able to create data for projects that are hypothetical or, or someone that hasn't filed an application yet, but working with the planning department staff, we have accounted for known projects for which traffic studies exist, including the previous application that you talked about, the, the senior center project and the, the residential uh, component that goes with it. And also what we included, which wasn't part of the discussion of the planning staff, is there are unbuilt units within East Mill and we accounted for that as well. Because again, when you look at seven years into the future, we want to make sure, just like the town is, that, that there is a workable access and circulation plan for the development as well. So we look at known developments and as well as vacancies or, or unbuilt development portions within uh, developments in proximity to the site. So we have accounted for that. So, and then the second second thing is that as a planning board, we can't tell people what to build on their lots and on their property. So if someone comes to us with a project and says this is what we want to build, we have to examine it. So we can't say you need to build in this area, or this area, or this area, unless zoning is changed, right? So we work with the zoning. If, if, if you know, there are studies to look at whether zoning should be changed in different places and, and we're looking at zoning downtown and things like that. The point I agree with in what you said is that we do need to look at how, we can't look at one single factor, right? So traffic is one factor and that's just what we're talking about today. Yeah. Um, if you've been to other meetings or seen any other roads, we've been talking about other things. We've mm -hmm. talked about effect on school, we've talked about um, how it would impact locally, uh, you know, the heights and things like that on the neighbors. So we're trying to look at all of that. Other things that I think we'll talk about is that we have to consider housing needs, not only in North Andover, but in the state of Massachusetts or in the area, uh, how it works with our master plan, the effects on um, you know, tax revenue versus cost and things like that. So yeah, we have to consider all of that. 
but there's no fancy machine that we can just throw all these numbers into. We just have to look at all of that, talk it out, listen to people that come forward, listen to the applicant, listen to our planning staff, and other staff, and make the best decision that we can. So okay. that's what we're trying to do. I, I would argue that there is mathematics to, since we already have the preliminary traffic studies potentially for Amazon and also for the middle school project, that those two projects should be added into the existing have, traffic studies here. I don't here. think we have for Amazon. Yeah, but it's something else we did for the midterm of that industry. Yeah. Why well, was I talking about the middle school, the athletics fields, all that area there, that project that is, I guess it's on hold right now or whatever, but it got passed by town so meeting. We used, yeah, so we used the traffic study there was done for the kindergarten, so that was the one that. Okay. And then Amazon, I didn't know if we've done a traffic study there, because that's no. going to affect traffic going the other way. And I guess you know, it's like the butterfly effect. It could affect, just any change affects everything else. No, that's true. So, and so could if they built a um, four-story office building, yeah. which they could do by right right now, yeah. that would also have an effect on traffic. So something's yeah. probably going to get built there, and it will have an effect on traffic, and it will probably not be for the better. The question is how much and what okay. we can do to mitigate that. Okay. Well, thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Koken. I'm a resident of 62 Milton Street, which is up in the library area. So I'm okay. a neighbor, but not in a butter, um, but a frequenter of many of the businesses in the <coughs> mill area. Um, I also walk my dog down Main Street, High Street. Um, I have a daughter who just got her driver's license who will be driving down High Street, up Prescott to the high school every day and back. And I have a son who's on the cross country team who runs around these streets daily. So I have um, very strong concerns about the, the traffic and the impact on this area. Even though I'm not in a butter, I do use these roads as many people in town do. Um, and what struck me is when I was here two weeks ago and Avalon showed some of the other properties that they've built um, as they were kind of giving that um, satellite image view of other properties, it really struck me how different a lot of them look from ours in terms of location, size, et cetera. And one of the things that struck me is that a couple of the properties they showed were, um, for example, the one in Saugus is on Route 1. Um, one of their other properties, and I found some of these looking at their 10K results that have number of apartments and different property sizes, et cetera. But um, they have property in Cohasset that has, I should put my glasses on, 220 apartments on Route 3A. Um, they've got an apartment complex in Bedford that's got 139 apartments right on Route 62. So a lot of their properties are right on major streets. And if they're not on major streets, they have really easy access to Route 93, Route 95. For example, the, the property they used to own in Andover is right on River Road that has direct access to 93. Um, the complex they own in Sharon that has 156 apartments is on Coney Street, direct access to 95. Um, so I just question the location of the size of this pro project, and it's not direct access to 495. Um, it's not direct access to 93. And the streets that we need to use, that people coming out of this um, complex will use, don't have traffic lights. Um, that was the other thing that struck me, is that all of the apartments they have that don't have direct access to a highway, um, they get onto a street that has a traffic light, that then gets them onto a direct highway. So as we're looking at Sutton, that the High Street and Sutton Street, there's no traffic light there. When we're looking at High Street and Main Street, there's no traffic light there. And so I'm really concerned about pedestrians, I'm concerned about traffic, and that's where I think, you know, yes, we know something's gonna go in there, but the size and the, the complexity of the added traffic component to that. Um, it gets to my second point, and I wanted to um, address kind of if, if Avalon is gonna be revising their plans. The other thing I noticed in a lot of those properties is that a lot of them have multiple entry and exit points. Um, so for example, that property I mentioned in Andover has two entry points that only has 115 apartments. Um, their property in Bedford has two entry points that only has 139 apartments. Yeah. Um, they also have properties that have divided entry and exit points to allow for better sight lines. So I would encourage them to take a look at what their options are in terms of those entry and exit points yeah. to help minimize the, uh, the tricky traffic coming so, out. Right, so we talked about that at a previous meeting. Uh, the difficulty is with additional curb cuts on high street that has its own um, dangers. If they mm -hmm. had, and I think I asked if they had any ability to um, cut through an exit to Sutton Street, because I think that would be an ideal way of um, mm -hmm. minimize, uh, dispersing the traffic. Um, at this point, it doesn't seem like that's realistic, but if so, I think that would make a big difference in the 
project. So mm -hmm. we have been looking at that. I'm not sure that there's a great answer. Right, and I guess my, my answer to that is, are they trying to shoehorn something into a space where it just doesn't fit? Is it a square peg going into a round hole right here in downtown? <laughs> Hi, my name is Jill Angelo Santo and I live at 41 Pearly Road. Um, could you bring up, I have just, I think, two quick points. Can you bring up the um, Sutton and High um, slide that you had here? Because um, I wanted to point out one thing which is not specific to this project but is specific to this intersection. Um, I walk, I have a dog, I walk around this neighborhood a lot. If you're coming down Chadwick, I guess it would be west, to that intersection, you cannot see if a car is coming down High Street. I have to step into the intersection to see if there's a car coming. So there's a stop sign there. If there's a car at the stop sign, I can see it, but that's all you can see. So if cars are coming down, if they're going too far, overshooting the stop sign, I can't tell. And I am basically currently taking my life into my own hands to just cross the street to go home. And being that this is a kind of already a known problem, adding, you know, an, especially in the rush hour, a number of cars to this intersection, is gonna be even more of a problem, I think. And I think pedestrian traffic is gonna be an issue with you know, somebody maybe getting hit by a car. Um, also, one of the things I worry about, which I know wasn't taken into account in the study, is so Pearly Road is just down a little bit for on this map um, if you were to come, I guess, south. Um, and it goes Pearly Road to um, Thorndike and it makes a little loop around and you come out back to Sutton. Are people gonna start, if that intersection gets bad, are people gonna start cutting down our neighborhood with these tiny little streets that won't be able to handle traffic? Um, I moved my driveway 60 feet um, on Irving Street, which is, it has no access to Sutton, and the DPW said it was too, 30 feet from the intersection was too close and it was a known traffic issue. And I had to convince them that the five cars that currently drive down my street my driveway moving so I could put a fence in from my yard was not going to be a traffic issue. It took me four weeks to convince them of this and they finally signed up on my permit. But if that was a concern, my moving a driveway maybe 50 feet um, on an area where the five cars drive down, how is this not a major traffic concern to have 250 units coming in just around the corner from that? Um, my last point would be, has anyone looked at in the traffic study, did you look at the um, on-ramp to 495 or the, the 495 intersection here? Because that is the worst highway on-ramp I have ever seen in my life. I recently moved to this neighborhood. You have to loop all the way. If you get on at 495, they're currently doing the construction. You have to loop all the way around, come back to go to, to 495 South. Um, and same like you know going north, you have to loop back around to come off the highway to get onto Sutton Street. Um, it's a major traffic issue currently with the way the, the pattern is. And I've seen also a lot of near misses with cars not knowing which lane they're in and going to the wrong way. So, and my thought is, if you're having a lot of people going to 495, if you're not looking at that, you're gonna have traffic backed up on Sutton Street if, if people can't get onto 495 because of the way the traffic pattern is there currently. And you said you have to loop all the way around to get to 495 south to go to 93. Um, so was that taken into account in the traffic study? I didn't see anything about 495. Just in qualitative terms relative to access to 495, it's not just this one access, the exit, uh, exit 44 that you hit on Sutton Street. There's actually exit 43 down by Mass Ave that actually this provides southerly access. So most likely if you're heading north on 495, the chances are you would come up uh, High Street, turn left onto Sutton and go 495 north. But if the intended direction of travel is south on 495, I mean, yes, yeah, someone can choose to go up Sutton, turn around at the next exit and come back, but most likely they're gonna head south on High Street. And so those cars would never show up at this intersection. They would go straight down to Mass Ave. My name is Dave Goldman, 56 Thorndike. I only want to make one point here is that uh, my two children, one of them goes to the NAMS, one of them goes to the high school, just starting soon. And while traffic studies may have been done on 
um, the recent traffic patterns in this area. I'm not convinced it's representative of the buses and the kids on foot and on the parents bringing their kids to NAMS and, and the high school. I think that's a significant amount of round trip traffic specifically in this area. This is right in the middle between the NAMS and, and the high school. I mean, there's a lot of traffic that I don't think is being represented. And when my kids are gonna be walking through this, I'm worried. That's the only point I wanted to make. Please take it under advisement. John Thompson, Sutton Pond. Two quick points. High Street to Sutton Street is not free flowing traffic. Many houses have, do, do not have off street parking. If it isn't a landscaping truck, it's a homeowner parked on the sidewalk. And if you're driving on your in a lane, you stop so the person can come the other way. That's today. That's reality. You can't go through that section because they're parked on both sides of the street, in the street. You know? So your four patents, excuse me, Fred, the four patents a bull, because you have to wait. Now, if you've got somebody behind you, there's two of you waiting, and same going the other way. The other, we're talking about this intersection. The town and its wisdom has approved 50 or 60 units on the opposite side of the street that is gonna use this intersection, coming the other way at us. What's the story with that? How about the, store, the rental in the parking garage, which comes into that uh, intersection? Merrimack College students using that with a shuttle. What about those cars? I mean, you add all this together, and these statistics don't mean a thing. Your things come, another 60 coming at you from across the street, plus the people coming in and out for the garage. And then they want to sell the garage. That's the next move. Hi, I'm Diane Montella from Sutton Pond. And I promise you, planning board, I didn't come with my own remarks today. Um, but uh, someone who took the time to prepare some remarks but defines herself as not a public speaker, as many people uh, feel they don't like to do public speaking, um, has has honored me by asking me to read her remarks and giving me permission to select some highlights from it, and then I'll present you with her written remarks. So this is from Carol Morris, who's here today. Um, and she has defined multiple categories of encroachments that come packaged with the plan for Avalon North Andover. So her message is this, um, encroachment of our traffic to our tiny residential neighborhood is her concern. At the last meeting, it was said that there are 600 parking spots, I think, in the region. And now, with the proposal by Avalon, we'd be adding 400, and I think the number was 34 last time more. That brings the number of parking spots, if you add to that 600, to over 1,000 cars and traffic in our tiny residential neighborhood. That does not include the counting of fire trucks, tractor trailers, buses, vans, and other resident cars out a little bit outside of our region, of that, of that nucleus where the uh, Avalon building is proposed. Overwhelming our tiny residential neighborhood and our safety will be these added, this added traffic. Should High Street and Prescott Street, just two streets, just two streets be subjected to all of that extra traffic from you know, multiple hundreds of vehicles? There's only one exit for these extra vehicles encroachment of home values follows that concern. No one wants to buy a home with an eyesore in the middle of our neighborhood and the congestion and added traffic. We should not, we, the taxpayers here before you, should not lose our home's values due to this proposal, which is not endorsed by the people who have managed to be able to be here and stay here and by the hundreds of people, 1,300 plus people that signed that petition sparked by the Finnamores. 
encroachment of our natural reserve, Lake Kachikawik, which apparently Ms. Morris dearly loves, how much water usage will these apartments stress our water system? So added pulling of water from the system. Will it result in extreme conditions in things like moratoriums on washing of cars, watering lawns, being told not to shower during certain times of drought? And we must think about that and protect our natural reserve. Encroachment of our school system. She notes that people, you know, spoke at the last uh, meeting about the uh, overwhelming the school system with um, added taxes that would be passed on to taxpayers in North Andover to do the changes that would be needed to accommodate the 44 children that were identified by uh, Avalon as predicted to live in the building. Um, at the last meeting, a selectman said that the need to replace the trailer classrooms and the need to make additions to existing schools that are already overwhelmed still exists. And that's without this, the added strain of these apartments. So she's um, identifying that the selectmen have identified that as a problem already. Encroachment to town services, particularly fire service. So fire trucks having to deal with the extra traffic that's been noted before of coming down Prescott Street, et cetera entrance and egress with extra vehicles to deal with. Does the fire department have equipment in place already to deal with five-story buildings? Will there be an added burden on the taxpayer if the fire department has to purchase that equipment? Uh, we have not talked about what stress these approved apartments and this proposal will have on our electric supply, electric um, uh, suppliers, including heating so and air conditioning. Uh, uh, we are town departments have looked at, they look at fire, they look at police, they okay. look at all of that. Great, thank you. And um, lastly, she notes encroachment on our wetlands and displacement of underground water should the proposal as it stands go through. Um, many of us were at the Con Conservation Commission's meeting and they were taking that concern very, very seriously. On NorthAndoverMA.gov, there's a page called water Wetlands and Your Water Supply. You might not want to drink the wetlands but they are important to our water supply. And there's a whole tutorial there about how the wetlands are critical to cleaning our water, maintaining the, uh, t you know, the water tables in our reservoirs, et cetera. And so Carol asks, where will the displaced water go? Um, and I would like to, to th and she closes by saying that she would like to thank this planning board for their service to the town of North Andover and for their commitment that you've been demonstrating to the taxpayers to look at all of these encroachments. She would like to ask the planning board members if you were homeowners in our tiny residential neighborhood, how would you feel about these multiple encroachments possibly resulting from approval of a plan like this? Where you currently live, would you like an eyesore and all the problems that we've addressed tonight landing in your neighborhood? And respectfully, Carol A. Morris. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I see two more people. Let's do two more. I do would, would like to wrap this up. Uh, hi, Jeff Koken. I'm with, um, I'm at 62 Milton Street. I'm actually not going to express my opinion because I think my wife expressed it rather eloquently for both of us. Um, so I have actually a simple question, I think, for people associated with the project. Um, specifically around the, um, the MV, uh, the Merrimack Valley Regional the MBRTA bus, the express one that runs down to downtown Boston. Has there been discussions with that bus in regards to A, the, I think the loss of parking that the project would actually take up and then also the accommodation for that one, but like not the regional, not the local stuff, but the kind of commuter bus into Boston. Has but there been any discussions and can you just kind of summarize what um, their kind of reaction to the project is? We met, we met with MVRTA, and they're very excited about having more potential riders right at the front door. Um, we would work with RCG to make sure that the bus could continue to be accommodated and there would be parking for um, you know, people that would drive into the site to get on the bus as well. Okay, thank you. Good. Okay, thank you. Hi, Judy Luciano, Marble Ridge Road, so no NIMBYism, not my neighborhood. Um, but just in listening, um, you know, if you were going to put this development like on Assembly <laughs> Row in Somerville, 
I'd be psyched. Like, I'd probably want to live there. I could go out in the morning, get my Starbucks, hop on the train, go to work. But you're plopping this massive development right in the middle of a residential neighborhood. And it looks like, if I read it correctly, um, 250 units may have to be scaled down. 400 parking spaces. I don't know if that includes guest parking or if it's just for residents. But that equates to 1.6 parking spaces per unit. And when you're talking two and three bedroom units, North Andover is not a walkable community. We drive everywhere. We have to. You know, I don't see people riding their bike to Market Basket to get laundry detergent and a gallon of milk and biking back. We take our cars. So I don't think that that number is accurate. I would think that it's low and that 84 cars leaving in the morning in turn, I think would also be low. So I just think that that's something to consider and uh, you know, maybe needs further looking into. Hi, John Finnamore, 90 High Street, next to the, uh, the petitioners. Um, I'll keep this short because I think I'm the last one. Uh, I agree tonight that it, tonight is not the night to air all of our grievances, right? We have a laundry list of things that some of which have been repeated tonight, right? So we'll stay on, on traffic. Actually, I'll make one macro point. Um, if you think about the first session that we had tonight with Takis, right, whether you're for that or against that, the petitioners listened and they came back with adjustments, right? We are, we, the, the conservation community of the Atlantic was very emphatic, gave you a very emphatic no. Uh, in fact, I said, why are you even here, right? we would implore you to not bring this plan forward without the adjustments that the town is looking for. Traffic is just one of the laundry list of concerns that, uh, the, uh, that the community has. Uh, Gail just brought up one note. If you've ever been stuck at that, um, uh, Sutton Street is a clear problem, right? So that Sutton Street intersection and the, uh, the Prescott Street intersection, I'm really glad that those were identified. If you guys can help solve that problem, um, great, and, and do it without a rotary, please, but solve that problem. That's worth a beer. I won't support the current project, but I'll buy you a beer um, at Jamie's. Um, but so, why are you? I hate rotaries, but I actually kind of think I know, that I, know. I actually kind of think that would actually be good. But <laughs> I hate them. But that's your default to go do a rotary. Like right? find no, something else them, first. I think it would. I think it would work. It's better than what we have now. Anyway. Please come back with something else. We implore you. This plan won't work. You've heard it said many, many different times. Um, I sound, you're shaking, you're nodding your head, I think, so that means you're, you're listening. <laughs> You'll come back with something. That's great. That me probably means we're going to have to start some of this over, but the plan as it's defined won't work, and I think you all know that. Yeah, so that, was my initial, that was my initial point at the beginning is that. And so you know, that's what we're going to talk about now. About. Yep. So, I, so I think, right. So, and, and I would say that, with just to compare it to the talk. So I agree with you, John. I agree that there should be a time to listen to what everyone said and put it all back into the plan and say, okay, what can they as the applicant, what can we do that works for us and that may work for other people? And that's what we're hoping to see. Um, with a smaller project like that, it's a lot easier when you have five neighbors or 10 neighbors to do that than when you have a bigger project that has a bigger impact. So. Um, the CONCOM decision has sort of given a, everyone kind of a pause time, so I think you should really take advantage of that. So I would like at this point to hear from members of the board what you would potentially look for in general terms in a revised plan. Things that concern you, things that you appreciated in this plan, you know, um, to the extent that anybody wants to give them advice and feedback. So. Distance to the immediate abutters on High Street. They showed us the distance from the building corner to the houses, the measured distance, but to the lot line, it's significantly closer. And I think those people have the right to enjoy their entire yard. Um, so I, I'd like to see it shifted on the lot, at the very least. Yeah, I mean, I echo those comments. I think it's what we're struggling with more than anything else is the size and scale of that uh, building in relationship to the surrounding property. And it's most pronounced exactly what you said, 
But it extends all through, and, it's, and that's right. I mean, at the very first meeting when we talked about the pretty pictures, but we didn't see uh, building profiles and how you could view that in from the property. And that's what I think, I think the site visit will help address that. Uh, the other thing is you're talking a little bit about the subdivision road and we have yet to you know sort of have what I'm going to call an engineering discussion of the subdivision road and why it was laid out the way it is and how it's laid out and so forth and I also think uh, you know we're talking about conservation commission but I I've walked to the property a number of times just by myself I don't understand, you have yet to tell us what your building constraints are and why you laid it out the way you did based on the slope of topography and so forth. And I think that would be, uh, would be a helpful thing. Uh, but above all, it's, it's, it's the just the sheer number of units and the size and the mass of, of, of the buildings. I think that's what we're all struggling with. Do you have any thoughts? I mean, and I, I'd be happy to get mine about, you know, where I'm envisioning, you know, this going. But I mean, you can come back to us with any numbers you want. But for me, 250 is too much. I mean, it just it just is. I mean, if we're talking 100, 150, I think we're talking about a, a different project, three stories as opposed to five. I think we're taking now not set on any of those things, but just that's where it's in my head. Um, so, but first, I just or, you know I'm just gonna I just want to talk about some of the positives I see, okay? Because I think we've heard a lot of heard a lot of negatives. I think that. We do need more apartments and units, and I think we need them downtown. Um, if you look at our housing production study, uh, if you look at Massachusetts, any housing production study in Massachusetts, there is an extreme shortage of housing in the area, in the state, and even in our town. And it's very difficult to make any dent in that if you don't do multifamily. And it's very difficult to make any dent in that if you don't do it it, it, there are very few pieces of land that are available that would um, support it. Additionally, if you want to support downtown businesses from a planning perspective, then having bodies in that area is the best way to do it. Um, and that's why you know, I, I know in one of our earlier meetings, we had a packet from the owners in, in the West Mill of why, of, of um, at least some of the businesses there, why they would appreciate it. So I do think it's important. That being said, I'd love to see some of it be affordable. You don't have to, it's not part of any requirement, but for me that contributes a lot to the public good to have affordable units. We're at eight and a half percent, I think, is that right? In the next census, I believe that's probably gonna go down because at this point we don't have any inclusionary zoning. Hopefully by next year we will. But to me that makes a public benefit uh, and if it's not gonna be here, it's gonna be somewhere else and those students and those units are gonna come at some point. So the more we can address that now, I think the better projects are. And that doesn't go just go for you. You just happen to be the person in front of me that I can, can say that to. Next apartment to the common want it, I wanna say it to them too. There should be ones that have uh, affordable. Um, I'd love to see um, improvement to the subdivision road, really work with DPW and make sure that they approve of it. Um, I'd like to see further mitigation of the number of cars. So um, anything you can do with a shuttle bus, you know, so it, I love the idea that it's close to the um, a mile and a half from this subway station. But if you have everyone driving there, it, it makes no difference. So if you have a bus that goes every 20 minutes, uh, you know, with eight people, and those people don't have to have a car or only have to have one car so that they can drive out on the weekends to get groceries, because yes, I think every unit's gonna have a car, but you may need one instead of two if you can take a little bus that takes eight people and goes to, um, the uh, train station, or if it goes to RCG, or if it goes to, you know, one of the other properties, or if it comes from Forgetta and loops around, you know, work with them. I think there's a way to reduce all of the traffic. Um, same with the MVRTA, so I'm glad someone asked you about that. So those are the things I think, I, th I personally think it's appropriate to have housing there. I think it's good to have housing there, but it's gotta be scaled way down. Um, you can convince us of the numbers, or me of the numbers, um, but I think it's got to be scaled down. So that's where I'm coming from. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, for me, it's uh, size and, and massing. You know, the, the overall size, which I think all three have said, and where the size is concentrated right up against that neighborhood. Um, and I also, uh, you know, take your points about, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, of right, what can be done, right? right? So 
the notion of housing there, uh, I, I agree with the chairman that there's some benefit to that. But um, when the scale of the housing, you know, scale gets to the point that it, it if it's overwhelming, then it then it it uh, overwhelms the good. So, and I think we're all struggling with that. So, uh, you know, you're you're this is you're, you're an expert at this. So, help us understand how housing can fit in this location, um, uh, in it, with these roads in this part of town, so that we can help you make it work. And my sense right now is we can't because of the scale and the massing right up against the neighborhood. And then one micro point on traffic, I would really like to see the delta of cars moving out that access road, not with the denominator of existing traffic on High Street, but with the denominator of existing volume on that access road. And I'm not sure that you did a traffic study on the access road itself, because that's not one of your orange dots, I don't think. Road. Coming out of the site. Site driveway. The site driveway. The site driveway, the leg coming out eastbound, so coming out of the site is part of that intersection. So you, ha so you have, have the data. current data of volumes of cars coming out of the site. Peak hours, yes, we do. That's the number I want to see. If it's 84 cars, not for the whole morning, but for the peak hour of the yep. morning, I can over see. what existing number of cars, not on High Street, but on that access on road. Yep. I can provide you that. And uh, I think if we see that, then we're seeing oranges and oranges. Yep. And that would be very helpful. Okay. Anything? Yeah, I get to echo uh, fellow board members really around the size and scale, I think there's such an opportunity to complement and add to the neighborhood versus it kind of dominating what's there, but really adding to the richness of the neighborhood. Um, so I think that's just a great opportunity to do and help build that area. Um, and also echoing the concept of uh, affordable units, if possible. And I have one more item. Okay. But this is not for them, it's for you. Okay. <laughs> Is it possible for the board to get some type of tabular representation of number of multifamily housing units added in this town over the last period of time? Five years, 10 years, per year. Is that possible? Because one of the comments that I thought was very helpful was let's not just look at this in a snapshot of time. So, I mean, we do know, I mean, I'm giving somebody work if you agree as a chairman, but I would like to see, I would like to see what is the pattern and number of multifamily housing units per year over the last five or 10 years so that I can understand how does this fit in. Great, so we can tabulate it. I think we'd have to be careful of how we use it. Okay. For our consideration of the special permit criteria and evaluating a specific project. But I think we can use, you know, I don't know that, like, I don't know that we could say we've had X, now we're cutting it off and saying, you know, you can't well, have X. Y. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm trying to put it in context. Yeah. Yes. So I think we can, I think it's fair to get the data. I think we just have to be okay. smart about how we use it. So, Jean, we can get that from the housing plan, right? Yeah. I can do it from the top of my head. Okay. <laughs> well, I think we should, I think. I'm starting with Thursday. The, the, well, the two the things that are permitted. Yep. And then actually develop, right? Because there's some that have been permitted have that haven't been constructed developed yet. within five years. We have some that have been permitted and under construction. We have some that are permitted and not begin construction. And we have some before you today. Yeah, so I think that would be yes. a good chart with those broken out. Okay. Could I just say one thing, please? Well, can you? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see it. Hi, my name is Barbara Sir from Sutton Pond. Um, I totally agree if they could move the buildings further away from the neighborhood, but please don't move them any closer to Sutton Pond. <laughs> <laughs> you could just put them in the middle underground. That would be perfect. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Um, all right. So, next steps. 
Uh, I don't think it makes sense to do a site visit right now because we're re you're reconstructing the plan, so I don't think it makes sense at this point. So let's come back on August 20th and see where we're at. Then sure. I, I think that our next step is, as we've said, we're going to go back to the drawing board and look at the site plan. I think the major comments are the access and also the density, especially as it relates to the abutters. We've heard that loud and clear. We're looking at it already based on what we heard at conservation last, year, last week, which was probably the, um, you know, is going to make the biggest change to the plan because uh, a lot of it was predicated on waivers that we're not going to be able to get now, um, which is a, somewhat unfortunate because that's where that's away from the abutters. So, um, but that said, we're working on it, and I'll come on uh, August twentieth. Uh, I may have a plan. I may just have an update, but uh, I think we're going to start with a new site plan and some new views before we rebuild all the engineering around that, and maybe we can just talk about setbacks and views and architecture and density, and then once we have some level of consensus with the board on that, then I'll release all the engineering again. Um, that would be my request if that's acceptable to the okay. board. Are, are yep. you also, as part of your thinking, uh, taking another look at perhaps opportunities for another exit to Sutton Street? The issue with that is you would have to fill wetlands because there's a wetland that goes right along the property line that leads over to the um, Clean Harbors. And based on the feedback we got from the uh, Conservation Commission last week, we don't think that's on the table. Bridge? <laughs> well, there already is a bridge on this site. Um, not on my site. <laughs> I know. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So why don't we continue to August? Anything else, Jean? I would just add, um, so as far as the definitive subdivision plan, it looks like we're really not close to that. We just talked about yep. September 5th being the date to either withdraw or yeah. on the 20th extend. I'm curious to your thoughts. Is it what do you? I reviewed it with council today, and her interpretation is, it, although it was filed, it wasn't contingent on whether it was denied or approved. It was 90 days, not the 135. So. Let, me, let me get a request. Can we talk about that offline? Okay, but. Okay, let's confer with RCG, but we can talk about that on the 20th. Uh, but okay. I think we're, we just need to talk to RCG about what our combined take on it. Yep, that's just the one time table that it's really sensitive and, and I know there was discussion about being 135 in the past and I went to council today. Okay. 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 Great. So we'll continue you. to August 20th. Thank you. Thank you everyone who came out. Thank you. Can we get a motion? Do we have it? We don't have anything else, right? Okay. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Uh, I assume there's no minutes because it's not on the agenda. Um, yeah, hey, there was Jean, no Jean, 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 Jean,